Well, once again, we are here on iRacing Live for one of the most historic events that there is in world motorsport. And it's here, only on Racebot TV and iRacing Live. It's the 12 hours of Sebring. Coming up. Okay, we're clear. So, hello, uh, welcome along, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us for the 12 Hours of Sebring here on iRacing Live, brought to you with Racebot TV. And uh, what a race it promises to be here from Sebring International Raceway. Let's get a few things out of the way. First of all, air temperature 26 degrees centigrade, part of the cloudy with winds at three kilometers an hour. Almost a uh, about three and a half, uh, four kilometer race track. 3.5 miles long, 17 turns, and as we say, 12 hours in length is this race. And, uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Hope you're uh, well. Paul Smith here, and uh, we're going to be here bringing you this coverage for the first three hours of the race. We will be stepping aside after that uh, for the uh, middle part of the race. Then the final three hours of the race, we're going to be bringing you here also on iRacing Live race spot tv this evening so make sure you stick around lifetime and scoring will be available all the way through the event once the race gets up and away which is racebot.tv forward slash timing today paul smith here just a couple of things also to mention first of all um just like to wish all the best wishes to uh, will vincent who's not been too well these last few days so uh, hope you get well soon and that's uh, and that you uh, take it easy and rest up uh, there and also just want to give a quick mention also uh, about the uh, the sad news that uh, the commentary world and motorsport world has lost Henry Hope Frost absolutely uh, fantastic commentator and broadcaster uh, had such a passion such a fever for motorsport and uh, he will be dearly missed uh, our thoughts at Race Spot TV go out to his family and everyone uh, who knew him such a, an inspiring person as well, such a nice person. Uh, I was unfortunately not able to uh, meet him, but got to see him do various interviews at the uh, Autosport International show. And uh, yeah, you couldn't you couldn't beat his passion for motorsport. Uh, I'll bring in uh, now our commentators for today. Uh, Alvin Yevers is joining myself, and to lead this broadcast here as well is none other than Mr. Jake Sperry. Thank you, Paul. The eyes of the world turn to watch Sebring here in Florida. The world is watching to see who can start to pick up this momentum as we head into spring, into March and into the motoring season. You talk about things that have been going on. For example, the VRS iRacing Championship that has been going on and that has been causing quite a stir. You talk about things like the iRacing World Championship Grand Prix Series set to kick off next week, but nothing quite like 
what we are going to see today. 12 hours worth of racing is always going to be something worth keeping an eye out on. And the best of the best have decided they want to turn up to the fold. And Alvin, when you talk about Sebring, it's not a circuit that screams elevation change. But very much like Silverstone, it is still one of the classics because of it. It definitely is. And yes, just because it is a 12-hour race doesn't mean it is half as easy as the 24 hours of Daytona. No, this race here, it is 12 hours, but the track is really abrasive. It's really bumpy, and all the drivers are going to have to be on their toes for 12 straight hours. And the key to success and here pretty much surviving and patience and for sure all these drivers will have to get every single ounce of patience and here if they want to make it to the checker flag they certainly do three classes of category then spanning 54 drivers so we have ourselves our c7 corvette daytona prototypes we have ourselves the gte field fords versus ferraris and then, of course, we have the GT3 field, which always proves to be a very interesting category, especially indeed. It is a little bit disappointing, the fact that we will not be running ourselves the brand new LMP1 vehicles. But, of course, we are under IMSA rules for this one, Paul. And IMSA rules, they are just as exciting, if not even more. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to see the uh, the, Toyota, the Corvette Daytona prototype here today. It's, uh, it's a fantastic vehicle. Very tricky to drive at, at times, but uh, it is a rewarding car as well. I've driven this car a couple of years ago in this uh, very event, and it is, it is a really fun car to drive once you get your head around it. It certainly is. Let's get up on your screen, though, how qualifying has been and gone. Let's start with your prototype category and the age-old rivalry that's been brewing for the last seven, eight months or so comes back into full force. Thrustmaster Mavano, DP Black. The triple three machine it has the fastest time overall vendavar sim racing blue will start from second on the grid with teo martin esports and jim racing a gtr center in fourth position pure racing team white will start fifth with team hoixingveld in sixth position thrustmaster milano dp red will start seventh and starting in eighth overall is the aptly long name dave Kammer's massive wall of text um uh, version model seven i believe is what we are seeing with that massively long team name always nice to see a nice joke name here and there but from there we move down to gte pure racing team gte blue they have a chance to push maximilian venick here today to the sim racing observer i rankings world number one with a very good result simrc.de bavaria will be looking to stop that in second follow me esports will start third with thrustmaster mavano gte in fourth simrc.de florida will start from fifth with team bushwick racing pink red face racing gte white seventh and the orion race team hpp will start from eighth and into gt3 Esther Racing Team providing the shock for this one then, as they will get the pole position with Core Sim Racing in second. Pure Racing Team Red and Black third and fourth with Evolution Racing Team in fifth. VRS Koala Sim Sports, they've not had the best of showing so far in World Tour events. They'll start from sixth with Hoixingvel Core Motorsports and the comers of SRT Esport Green in eighth position overall. 54 vehicles then will be taking themselves to the starting grid in just one moment's time. We will, of course, be having a rolling start for this one, a full lap rolling start of this circuit. And a lot of people understand what is needed of them. They need to be pretty much on the offensive as quickly as they possibly can here. Because although this is a 12-hour race, Alvin, you still have to try and factor into track position. Track position, where you are, and also the strategy, and those, and those will be what the three key things in here today. Especially these, when it comes to strategy, that'll be one of the important things. Because yes, twelve hours, of course, you cannot make it with only one driver. You gotta have two, maybe even three, four drivers. So when you come into the pits, when you get the fresh driver, when you get that the driver that you need, when you get the driver that you want, that is a key thing in here today as well. Yeah, that's certainly going to be one of the cases. And I think that today here, we're going to see a lot of teams, Paul, looking to try and experiment with certain driver lineups. Because Sebring, yes, while it is one of the World Tour events, 
it is one of those events which I think drivers want to try and use and work with as the pace car now sets off here as we are behind uh, the Porsche 911 first safety car as we now look to go one full lap around the circuit. Yep, one full lap around here in this uh, event before we get up underway. Turn one, a tricky corner, especially at the start of the race because uh, it sort of funnels down. It's a really wide entry, but it funnels down onto the track. So you can have a few incidents at turn number one. Drivers want to be careful of that one. And this first sector relay is really a tight and twisty part of the track. So getting away well and not getting involved in shenanigans in this early part of the first lap and in the start of the race is going to be crucial around here. Yeah, you need to make sure that you are clean and efficient, especially with the tight and narrow sections of the track, especially as the prototypes head through three, four, and five, heading now into big bend of turn number six out on circuit. And there's a lot of overtaking opportunities around this circuit, Alvin. You talk about the dive into the hairpin. You talk about certain areas that you look to try and get on the aggressive factor. And I think that what you need to see is a lot of people having, you know, a look into certain corners, especially Sunset Bend, I think, is going to be one of the best places to try and have a look. It certainly is when you, when, when we think about steering, it's not, it's not, it's not necessarily a track that has plenty of overtaking opportunities and yes you just mentioned two of the key ones jake but also going into turn one it is really wide and really narrow so we may see some people trying to go for a dive just 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 before it narrows and then the other thing to consider maybe not at the start of the race maybe not with 30 minutes into the race but once the pit cycle starts going through going into turn one and having the cars coming back into the racetrack out of the pits that'll be something in That'll be something really interesting to watch because as you get out of turn one, you gotta get onto the pit exit as well. So that mangling, well, that's something to keep an eye for. That's definitely something that you need to keep an eye on. So I think a lot of people will be looking for opportunities as they now head through this back stretch of circuit. Looking now here to the left hander of Bishop coming up in just one moment and this sort of fast flowing section of the track pool it's all about how much momentum you can carry as you head to the likes of Le Mans and the Ullman Strait. Yeah absolutely you can use these curbs around this section of the track they're quite low curbs here so you can really uh, be aggressive on the curbs around this section it's all about downforce here keeping as much minimum speed up but then get the car slowed down for this right hander here onto the back straight and it's it's crucial to carry speed down here because it is an overtaking opportunity into that final corner. It is an overtaking opportunity. It's though going to be the age-old story, Vendaval versus Mavano. The pair of them have battled so hard already this year. You talk about the likes of the sports car open. They've been pretty much nose to tail with each other. You talk about the likes of the World Tours. You talk about Neo. They are always up there scrapping with each other, and they are always looking to get the one-ups over each other. Don't count out Teo Martin. Don't count out Jim Racing either, Tom Valentini, and, of course, the likes of Alvaro Romero behind the wheels. But rounding the final corner, Sunset Bend, the corner uh, of 1,004 lines. Which one you take is the one nobody quite knows. Which one is the quickest? We are behind Tommaso Carla, though. Green flag is, though, in the air. And let's get ourselves going, then. 12 hours starts pretty much instantly. Three wide. We're going to go for fourth, fifth, and sixth. There's now Patrick Wolf. Well, and Christian Kiewit now want to go and battle it out with Romero into turn number one. They come along, already contact, and round goes Teo Martin into the middle of the circuit, surviving, I believe, was Tom Valentini of Jim. I think they got away with it fine. Second pack gets single file, and I think the third pack as well, having a pretty clean start to things, Alvin. A clean... Welcome back then, do apologise for the, uh, the few technical problems that we were having there, but we are now back live with the Sebring 12 hours here on iRacing Live and Racebot TV, and to hand you back over to your lead commentator then, Jake Sperry. Thank you, Paul. Arthur Lehoek in the Thrustmaster Mavana Racing GTE machine whilst cameras were away has got through on the Follow Me Esports GTE machine of Yao Vaz. So 
The Portuguese driver's got to find a way to get back past the Frenchman. Good news, Alvin, is Jürgen Frank isn't really able to get into an attacking position, especially when you consider the leading two drivers are now on islands of their own. It is, and now with 14 minutes into the race now that now it's when we're starting to see some pace from some of these drivers some drivers that are fighting for position yes they they will stay together pretty much for the for for the for the duration of the first and pretty much and then there may be some drivers that will be driving on their own for those drivers that those are the drivers that we need to watch in terms of space because those once you are driving on your own, yes, you have to keep the concentration even more because you may lose even track of time when it's time to come into the pit. So for those drivers, well, it has to be a really nervy moment. Yes, it is only 14 minutes, but still a long way to go. And a mistake we've also noted there from Carlo Labarti in the 381 machine, Thrustmaster Mavano DP Red. Now under a lot of pressure from Carly Janssen in the, thrust in the uh, Radicals Online 6 sideways machine makes the move on the inside then at the long right-hander, 90 degrees, so able to make it work at tower. Now looking up at position number four, and Paul, it's worth talking about Daytona because they started in a very similar position. They're already in the first 15 minutes plus five positions in this event. Radicals Online are the team on the move. Yeah, they've got a bit of experience in this car as well as uh, Thrustmaster Bavana now coming under pressure from behind. Team Heusingveld coming up alongside them as well. So certainly they've got the uh, the experience of this car, that's for sure. And uh, they certainly look good and, uh, and strong in this car, but we'll have to see how they go. It's a long race. It's still 11 hours and 44 and a half minutes remaining in this one. So uh, plenty of time for anything to happen here in this one. And we saw in that Daytona race that anything can happen right to the very end. Exactly. Anything can happen and it normally does. So Christian Kewitt then moves up into position number five with Team Hoixingveld ahead of Carlo Labarti in the Thrustmaster Mavano machine. I do want to go back though and talk GT3 though for a little bit. Marin Cholak holding himself out there at the moment the gap around 1.7 seconds at the moment Alvin worth talking about Marin Cholak it was a brave decision to leave Orion go form his own team move away from the iRacing World Championship and go into GT racing are we seeing here Esther Racing Team now looking to prove the potential and prove Marin Cholak correct well there's still plenty of, of time to go for sure but it seems like for now, Marin Kolak, he's doing a fantastic job leading the GT3 field. But yeah, it is a long year. It's always a challenge when you leave a team that's been established and you kind of go form your own. There is a lot of things to learn as a driver, as a team manager, as a setup mechanic. There is a lot of things that 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 you have to work through. But for Marin Kolak, so now, for, for now, it's just a matter of trying to enjoy the moment while you can. Yes, you are leading the field, but once pit stop time comes in it will be interesting to see if somebody will come in and sub for him who are the drivers that are going to be racing with him because that may give us a clue of who will be uh, forming this team in the future let's look at the 2016 gt champions at sebring we'll look at wave drive drs the number five machine giuseppe curry behind the wheel of that machine they're in a scrap right now with the 88 machine of triton racing 12 hour the polish team with marcin skazipchan behind the wheel and behind that alberto segovia trying to make inroads to the gte machine this one four position but looking to try and get back to different areas of the field you're going to see down to the inside then we'll try the v racing machine but unable to really attack on the brakes wasn't helpful gonna get close you can see paul just how that gte machine almost dwarfs the gt3 yeah certainly does i mean the thing is with this gte car is it doesn't have uh, doesn't have uh, abs so it actually breaks a little bit earlier than the GT3 cars because they can just mash that brake pad and, uh, and go into the corner. They don't have to worry about that. They've got ABS, whereas that GT car, they've got to worry about locking up the wheels. They've got to worry about looking after their tyres and uh, keeping everything under control. And that's they certainly what they're, they're doing. And in the slower corners as well, they've pretty much got similar grip levels because they're both on mechanical grip. It's through these faster corners where the GTE cars really shine. 
And let's not forget here in this situation, Alvin, that Skazipchak's not going to let this one go easily because he is in that uh, class-on-class scrap with Giuseppe Curry. So when it comes to the top speed, it's now going to have to rely on Segovia going to this inside, trying to make this move. Will try and pull out, but you can see the draft here really coming back to help here on Marcin Skazipchak. And you can see frustrated is that driver, as you can see Skazipchak very opportunistic then going down to the inside of Giuseppe Curry and I'm not sure Curry can really fight back but he will have the inside to turn one yeah but we also have to remember that that is Sunset Ben and any line can work and for and for now Giuseppe Curry has made it work but we may see three white going into turn number one with the three GT3 cars but from here and oh, oh. oh my god contact oh. and yeah that's how it could end and that's not the way you like to see things going especially with just 20 minutes in yeah, and Alberto Segovia, nowhere to go really, and that one then ends up in a little bit of problems, but we are now starting to get to the lap traffic stage of this event here, 20 minutes in. So Terry Kekkonen has the lead slim at the moment, 1.1 seconds, but now Vendaval have to negotiate the traffic, and traditionally, Paul, it is Thrustmaster Mavano who are the better traffic negotiators when it comes to races like this. Yeah, they certainly are the, the, the better ones for dealing with that. And uh, those, the, the, the very, I mean, you look at Tommaso Carlo, you look at how many uh, endurance events we've seen him and seen that team involved in. It's, it's just a matter of waiting patiently, making sure that your, uh, your time is right and then making those moves to work your way through. And the, and the thing is also, Van Devil. They're in a little bit of a disadvantage as well. They're the first cars to come up on that traffic, and it's a bit of a wake-up call for them when the leader comes up. But then, once the others start coming through, they're prepared for them. They're looking in the mirrors. They've got the team boss and spotters telling them, right, you've got this lap traffic coming up now. And that, so they're awake. But for that leader, it's always a little bit more tricky to start with on that first time through the field. And let's also remember here, Alvin, this is not a first choice team that Thrustmaster Mavano is going to put out as a card across the grass will go Alberto Sejovia. He wants to get out of the way of the leading two and does so very nicely. It's not Marcus Hamilton or Frederick Evers that we're going to be seeing in this Mavano DP Black machine. Or rather, we're going to see the driver of Jose Maria Lopez, Formula E driver. One of those drivers who has a lot of real world experience and one that elevates sim racing onto that platform. He's arguably up there on the level of a Nicky team. He is up there on the level of, say, a Max Verstappen in the way that he uses sim racing as a tool of development. And that is one of the great things that iRacing does provides to these real wheel drivers. It, it provides uh, accurate scan cars on accurate scan tracks, and that kind of helps them into the into their skills de into their skills development. If we think in the day and age that we live in right now, kind of on track testing is really limited due to budget and time constraints. So, trying to get your time in a simulator and trying to get all your lines, all your breaking points everything that you need all those cues that you as a driver need to get in i think it, it kind of costs like maybe 75 80 percent of the track preparation and then the uh, the other 20 percent well it comes down to the physical effort it certainly does we've got a battle going on in gte right now between the 30 the 14 and the 34 out on circuit so at the front of this train is julian afray for red face racing gte white behind that is yusa hitala in the inertia dash black star machine of course a shared effort between the pair of them that i find very surprising and behind that is joel guez in the logical vortex sim racing machine as well i want to talk about the inertia black star merger i think we could say for this event here paul because it's very rare that we get to see those sorts of partnerships come into play very famously uh, trans tasman racing and ttl esports came together in the vrs championship two years ago you look now at inertia and black star sometimes it is worth putting two teams into the same sort of team to try and get up there and get both of your teams to get the reputation and respect we've seen a few um combined efforts as uh, apologies for the uh, interruption of pictures there yeah we've seen a few uh, combined efforts i'm looking further down at the triple five they're uh, involved in a real battle uh, down in uh, 13th or 14th in their class as that team also got caravan Santowski makes their way through but yeah just going back to that uh, inertia black star effort for an event like this you, you, you see some collaborations happen 
and see them come together. And uh, really, if you feel that you've got a really good chance of getting a good uh, position, or even if you're working towards an eventual full-time merger as a group, these types of events are a good place to start that. Get the team used to working together and uh, get them really uh, working as a team and it, I'll tell you what, it's a nice paint as well actually, I'll give them that, they've done a good job on the half and half Black Star and Inertia paint. Yeah, it reminds you of the British American race in 1999 livery, the fact that they wanted two liveries, they couldn't have it so they put them both on the same vehicle. We also just saw Giuseppe Inucci lose two positions in the space of about half a lap for that Crypto G Racing Triple Five machine. One to Jan Senkowski of Team Hoixingvald, of course, uh, the reigning VLN champions, and then to Glacier Racing and Yoni Hagner. So Giuseppe Inucci, the New Yorker, his brother Pasquale, is also going to be in the machine as well at some stage, Alvin. You know, they're now dropping towards the back of this field, and they just have to find uh, an element of consistency now. Okay, how do I regroup now? How do I keep this vehicle on the island and consistent? All right, uh... I think pretty much Giuseppe Iarucci he is doing what he needs to do. He is keeping the car clean, and that and that is pretty much the main objective here in the first it, it, during the first hour, keeping the car clean. Try to not be involved in any incidents. Try to pick your battles if you can. Try to go for uh, try uh, try to overtake, but try to be smart. And I think for now Giuseppe Iarucci he is doing what he needs to do. He's being patient. He's taking his time. Once the as the race go. As the race goes on, I think we are going to see that car, the Triple Five, is going to make those positions. Yeah, he certainly does have that opportunity. ACR Zach Speed, though, the 29 under pressure. Here comes Sorg Esports P1 looking to make the move. Philip Sudbeck against Rene Kirchhoff, not going to happen. And let's make Cam Walsh very happy at Racebot TV. We're going to talk about the CTC racing teams. Jerno Fritsche and Nuno Marrera, two of the greatest classic Lotus drivers you will ever see in sim racing and these two teams now they want to start trying to make positions because they are currently pretty much last apart from the positive sim racing machine uh, Paul. Um, no. Rather unfortunate. Oh no he's, he's, um, he's there we we're, were losing you for a second but we've we'll got you back now Alvin. Oh, sorry. I don't I, I don't know exactly what happened in there but you know oh, okay things well, happen. I'll tell you what we, I'm having a few technical problems. This is just adding to them. This is uh, what we have to deal with with live broadcasting, ladies and gentlemen. It, it certainly is, but, you know, we are troopers. We will push on. Ricardo Castroledo versus Patrick Pichler here, 72 versus 33. They're both working hard here to pull back in Marin Cholak right now here, Alvin. The gap's come down by another two tenths of a second over the last few laps. It's a second and a half and soon we will have a train of three for the GT3 lead. And that'll be really interesting to see how the P2 and P3, how they start, how they start closing the gap here and there. But Marin Kallak so far doing a fantastic job to keeping the lead in there. Uh, I think he is doing what, uh, I, I think he's doing what he needs to do right now. Try, uh, try to keep the car clean, uh, you know, not be involved in any, city, in, in any silly battles where they with the Daytona prototypes, if if, the, if he sees a faster car, just let them go by, no problems. And I think he is doing a good job, just trying to keep the car clean. Once pit stop time comes in, just come in, do your service, and then get out. And Paul, when we talk about Patrick Pichler, I think he doesn't get the credit he deserves. If he was on pretty much any other team in sim racing, he would be heralded as one of the greats. Because he's in such a strong German team, like uh, Pure is, I think he gets himself put under an immense amount of pressure, and I think he gets lost in the shuffle for good or for worse. As we see again, Santeri Kekkonen trying to make his way through. He gets one as he looks to now try and attack the other, but he will get stuck through the left, right, left. And this is good actually play there from Peachler. He says, it's your job to get around me safely, not for me to get out of the way. Yeah, that's it. A lot of people uh, will know that Formula 1, and with its blue flag rules in endurance racing, blue flag, it's just an advisory. It's just here to tell you there's a faster car coming up behind you. There's no rules behind actual moving out the way. So very good driving from uh, Patrick there to be able to uh, just hold his line, keep it going as fast as he can. You can see behind he's got uh, Ricardo Castroledo as well. But yeah, he's a really, really, he's an underrated driver is Patrick. He really is. And 
I don't think enough people celebrate his achievements and his ability just purely because, as you say, he's in such a strong team there. He is in a very strong team, as we saw Santeri Kekin a little bit held up by Marin Cholak. He gets around that without too much more difficulty in that situation. It's now Tommaso Carlos' turn to negotiate the leading three in GT3 right now. But we'll see Tommaso Carlos really hit his better area. And you are right in the sense that his achievements don't get heralded as much as maybe they should do. So I think that is something that we are definitely going to see. Alvin... When we're talking about pure and core, you know, core sim racing really came to the boil in this last season. Pure have been around for year after year as one of the best. But the one thing that I think pure racing team are lacking right now is silverware because they are so good. They are so amazing. The only sort of fulcrum they haven't been able to conquer so far is VRS iRacing. Here's the main thing with pure racing. They are fast, no question about it. They have the drivers that can do it, no question about it. You can see it on the qualifiers. You can see it on race pace. But points are, are, are awarded once you, once you cross the checkered flag. And that is one of the main things that Pure Racing has been having a little bit of trouble throughout the years. They have the pace, but trying to finish the race, well, that is a whole different story. And, where it, and whether it is uh, mistake on their own or something that is pretty much pure bad luck well they need to find that factor to kind to to try to finish the races when they are leading because yes you uh, th uh sometimes finishing in p5 well yeah uh, for some uh, for some other teams that may be acceptable but for pure racing team they want to win and sometimes well the results are not there for sure Sometimes they're not. We've still got this pull going on in GTE right now between Redface, Inertia, and Vortex. And we're seeing how Yusa Hiatala is able to get close pull as they head to Sunset Bend, but not really able to attack Sunset Bend. Trying to pick the run up off the exit. Has a much tighter line to work with, but you see Julian O'Frey is able to really attack off that exit, get the traction down. There's no real opportunities then to really make that charge that longing attack that I think that a lot of people get to see. It is worth noting in this situation though, it is a Ford versus a Ferrari, so strategy could come into play. The Fords are better on their fuel. Well, I was going to say we, we, we've seen this in various of these uh, endurance events that if you're not going to be massively faster than the car in front and there's a bit of a gap between you and the next car, it might be worth just sitting behind saving a bit of fuel and making that move on the uh, pit stop of the pit strategy we are uh, quite a ways into the race into the first hour here about uh, 34 35 minutes into this race so far so things like the, D the daytona prototypes will be looking for a pit stop not in the far future actually and that's when uh, you start seeing this pit stop phase happen but that ford right now just sit there Get a bit of fuel saving with that draft, but see you know what? He's looking uh, a little bit impatient now, is Hitala. He's wanting to get past in that inertia black star car. Punchy, I think, is the word I'd use there. Juso Hitala's looking punchy. He wants to try and find a way through. He's probing for information. When he gets enough information, he will go and make that move. And I think that's what Hitala will be looking for as they head. Now through this next right-hander as they head up onto the Oldman straight once again. You'll see Hiatala now really looks to try and push on the accelerator. Use the draft, close in that gap. But the issue is that he closes, he closes, he closes. He doesn't quite get close enough. And you need a, a strong point of braking, I think is the right words to use when it comes to this right-hander of Sunset Ben. And again, Alvin, it's again the perennial game of sitting and waiting. And sometimes you have to wonder even if it would be worth letting Joel Guez through to try and use Guez as the pick to get past O'Frey. There is that possibility, and with uh, and with this race being 12 hours, you know, you can use that strategy if you want because there's really no point in, in trying to fight that position right now and try to say, okay, I won this position, I won the race. No, there's still a long way to go. So, yeah, some strategy here and there, it can come it can definitely come a long way and it can also uh, show us how 
Julian Alfrey, how can he bear under pressure from two really fast cars? Behind that, we have Targa racing with a five-car train. Yoni Hagner, Glacier Racing. Uh, Team Hoixenveld's in the mix. You've got Crypto Rate G Racing. And you can see down to the inside, Yoni Hagner will go. And Glacier Racing starting to think about making moves and is making moves. And Yoni Hagner, I think this is a renaissance in his career, Paul. We saw uh, in 2016, 2017, how he really struggled to find a vehicle that really suited him. But then suddenly he found himself in the likes of, say, the Audi GTO. And he went, this is my vehicle. I won't have it any other way. But look at that Targa machine look to try and attack back as they make the run to tower. Yeah, he's, um, he's not giving up the position as uh, Nile Quinn, that's for sure. Uh, but Yone Hagner, as I say, great to see him in that car doing so well in, in that Glacier Racing car. And uh, it's good to see Glacier Racing uh, doing a good job here. They're kind of in the midfield at the moment in that class, in that GTE class. But uh, they are moving forward and they are trying to get forward now there's just under two seconds between them and team gt in the uh, number 13 car so they're not that far behind the next pack of cars but down that back straight once again into the final corner they've just pulled out that little bit of a gap now as yoni hagner three tenths of a second so you would think for the moment he's got that position sealed and it's not just that, it's the vehicle behind all of it that they have to worry about. A certain Santeri Kekkonen, as Vendaval Sim Racing will look to try and make that lap traffic a factor. GTE traffic may be slightly more difficult to negotiate, Alvin, than the GT3 traffic, mainly because there is less of a difference in pace between the pair of them. It definitely is, and here's, and here's the deal. I'm pretty sure, though, when it comes to GTE and the Daytona prototypes, when we talk about levels of downforce, they are pretty much right there. They have the same level of downforce. What makes it different? Well, for starters, the GTE cars, well, they are running the, the Michelin tires versus the Continentals on the Daytona prototypes. So that kind of makes it a little bit of a scary moment so when we talk about handling. But the Daytona prototype definitely has the horsepower to try to overcome them. So it's really trying to, as soon as, soon as you get out of corner exit, Punch it if you are in the DP and try to and try to overtake on the straight because trying to go on, 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 uh, under braking, well, it's going to be really difficult. And they were very close to Miko Nermi and that inertia sim racing machine. So Santeri Kekkonen, we know how when he's in a slower category, he doesn't like letting vehicles pass. I think he's just very, very angry when he gets to traffic because he doesn't like to be it and he doesn't like to get past it either. So I think Santeri Kekkonen will have the bit between his teeth as he will look to try and attack through this. But you can see how he will get held up now through the left and right. It will only be when he rounds this final right hander to get onto the Oldman straight. They can really make the opportunity slow off the exit, though, was the driver of Niall Quinn in the Targa racing machine. He was too wide on the exit. They almost had to force it three wide there with the likes of Jan Senkowski trying to go down to the inside and makes the move. And you can see just how quickly it's cleared by a Kakanen. Yeah, it certainly is. And uh, down into that final corner, gets the job done. And uh, well, do we see a car going on to pit road? Yeah, we do. Crypto G Racing, G Giuseppe uh, Iannucci. Now, this is way too early for a scheduled pit stop, you would imagine. There's obviously something going on there. It's meaning that they're having to make a pit stop very early in the race here. The only thing I can think here, Alvin, in this situation is that Crypto G are going to try and run the tank dry on the next few stints, and they're getting the short stop out early. There is that possibility as well, and then, well, one thing to consider now that now that now that we are talking pit stops, for the GTEs, there's really not much strategy when it comes to fuel and tire because they are both done at the same time. So it's just a matter of you get in, put fuel, tires, and go. GT3s, well, that will be a totally different story because tires and fuel they are done separate. So that will be the the at the really interesting strategies where they will be coming from. The DPs, they are. They are similar to the GTEs in terms of pit stuff. So for the GTEs and the DPs, the question is, once you come into the pits, trying to minimize the amount of driver swaps that you're doing because that's where you're going to lose time. 
The traffic is playing a factor in GT3 and Patrick Pichler for the first time is within a second of Maran Cholak. So Cholak now becomes the man under pressure as Patrick Pichler looks to start slowly turning that screw, making sure that every half a tenth of a second that's reeled in Paul starts to become a real problem. Point is just in front of that. Off goes the prototype. That was Chris Santiso of the Delta I racing team. So Maran Cholak there, maybe a little bit of a lucky, fortunate situation there, but now Patrick Pichler is starting to bend Cholak to his will. Yeah, he's really uh, putting the pressure on here now as Patrick Pichler, as they're heading through this uh, rather fast high-speed left-handers into the braking zone. It's tricky with this one, you turn in and then brake for this right-hander. Try and hook your wheel over the kerb on that right-hander. Don't use too much that left, and then again, Get the car over the kerb on that right-hander. You get the best possible run out of here. Pichler just not able to keep with Cho uh, Cholak at the moment. In fact, I would say that Marin has just pulled away slightly through that section. And he's going to hold that six-tenths of a second lead that he's got at the moment here. Yeah, six-tenths of a second for the moment. But right now, you're going to see more traffic try and uh, assert itself in. This is Philip Sudbeck of the Sorg Esports machine behind that. Rene Kirchhoff trying to stay with it in the ACR Zack speed machine. So Ricardo Castroledo, don't count him out in this situation. He needs to make some progress going forward. We've just seen Red Face Racing GTE White also come down onto the lane. So they're making an early stop. Where they come out, though, in comparison to Crypto G, they were in the group ahead. They should get out with not too much worry. And the answer is no, no worry at all. They get out, but they are in the middle of the traffic here. They will have to get past the likes of Jack Sedgwick. Alvin. It's actually yes, and that'll be a really difficult task in here, trying to trying to ne trying to negotiate the traffic, and that is one of the key things here in this race as well. Once you start going through traffic, trying to negotiate it, and as the hours go by, this traffic will get spread out even more. So now I'll I'll say now is the most difficult time to go through traffic because the cars they are still bunched together, but once the race keeps going, pretty much the whole field will be kind of spread out. So it'll be. No rest pretty much for from I'll say hours two or three all the way to the end because you will have to deal with at least one car going into the braking zone pretty much each time. Oh, can I ask you a question about Inex? Because I, I see the driver lineups that they pull out and they've lost drivers like Yoni Tamala over the years. And I wonder if Inex has too many drivers of one type of category. For example, I see Jack Sedgwick as this driver who would be good at ending stints the same way that he did, say, in VRS iRacing uh, a couple of years ago. Um, would you say that there are too many drivers who are classed as anchors uh, at Inex? Oh, you love your anchor drivers, don't you? Um, I love an anchor. It's, it's a tricky one, is that? I mean, we've seen how teams have sort of grown and uh, and got smaller over the years and how different drivers move across different teams. In X, they're a bit of a, an interesting one there. They've sort of, as you say, Jack Cedric, he is sport more sort of that, that get you through that middle stent of uh, middle section of a race kind of driver. Considering when you've got PJ Sturgios uh, is position behind in class as well as teammate, They're I really don't know how to answer your question, Jake. It, it's, a, it's a tricky one because he is a good driver, is, is Jack. Don't get me wrong. We see him in the uh, Neo Endurance series on uh, Raceball TV and our racing live. So uh, he is of a certain caliber. It's just whether he's in that top one percent of drivers in that team. To be in that team, you've got to be good. So, um, you know, the field, they could entrust him to start the race, which is, some would say, is the most difficult part of the race. It certainly is. And don't get me wrong, when I ask that question, I don't think Jad Cedric is a bad driver at all. I think he's a very, very good driver. I just don't think that his role suits the purpose. For example, look at Pure Racing Team GT Blue right now. You've got someone like Maximilian Beneke behind the wheel. And yes, he's a God-given talent, but his talent is pushing forward. He's got an 11 second gap over CMRC.de, Alvin. And he is working alongside Maximilian Venig, alongside Jonas Volmeyer to help Maximilian Venig 
potentially get to the world number one status in the Sim Racing Observer I rankings. Well, and here's the and here's the other thing that you also have to think. Sometimes on these events, yes, you have the big teams and and you may have your anchors, you may have your starters, you may have your your mid drivers, but sometimes. For these special events, you know, some drivers uh, perhaps, may, uh, perhaps may say, you know what, I'm going to save my efforts towards the big events, the VRS GT Series, the iRacing Grand Prix Series, and they may just skip these events altogether. And sometimes as a team, you pretty much have to race with what you have. And sometimes, yes, you may have the drivers that are safe for the last part of the race and say, well, you know what, this is this is what we have in here today. So I'm, I'm going to have to start the race, even though I prefer to finish the race. Dave Kamez, massive wall of text, is under threat. It will be having a too long don't read section if it's not careful. If Tom Valentini and Jim Racing GTR Center wants to get in on the aggressive factor. But Paul, let's talk about George Sandman. Here's a driver who is 58 years of age. Here's a driver who has one of the longest and most successful tenures in sim racing. And here you have a driver that if a Hall of Fame came up, he would be one of the first names you put on that sheet. It'd certainly be up there in the uh, in the selection box, that's for sure, for uh, a potential Hall of Fame uh, slot if we're going to uh, go down that route. Maybe that's something for uh, a certain uh, observer of sim racing to sort out. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, he's, he's, he's got a bit of a challenge here, though. Tom, Tom uh, Valentini behind him, putting the pressure on and uh, both cars sliding about through that section through those fast left and right down the back straight here once again just keeping the gap at about six tenths five tenths of a second this is where the slipstream is coming into effect now onto the brakes once again and uh, george salmon doing a good job at the moment holding on to that ninth place oh, but two off. that's three vehicles off and one of them is narquin one is miko nermi and all oh, Sandman getting held up there on the brakes as Madden came in and Ramiro came in as well. Also on the lanes, Carlo Labarti. Pit stop window. Suddenly Alvin just burst into life. Well, we are in into the pit window for the Daytona prototypes. They pretty much can go into around 45 to 50 minutes into this race. And now it's the time for the Daytona prototypes to come into the pits and see what type of strategy comes in. George Sandman into the pits it doesn't look like like they are going to change drivers we also got into the pits we got carlo lavati we got alvaro ramiro from teo martin esports so yeah the pit cycle for the daytona prototypes it's starting for sure it's starting for sure and i know we can't get a replay of it paul but that all happened when miko nermi ran into the back of the driver of what was going to be Niall Quinn. So that was never going to be happy. That was never going to be interesting. Also in is Nuno Marrera of CTC Racing Red, who has dived down onto the lane. So we're seeing that the prototypes now, they're looking to come in, consider making the stops in the early stages. The next question that will come along as we see three wide on the back straight, Dustin Hickman there with Hayden Burns out there as I believe it's lap traffic on lap traffic. The question will be, when will Santari Kekkonen dive down onto the lane, and will it be Mavano making yeah. the dive first with Tommaso Carla? In fact, here comes Kekkonen now, Paul. Yep, yeah, certainly does. Onto pit road now. And uh, he's got a long way to go before he gets to his pit stall. He's right at the end here. And uh, this is going to be the interesting one. As we say, he could change tyres and fuel with this car at the same time. And... Uh, into his pit stall now stops the car thrust western mavano stayed out for the time being so they're going an extra lap here that's crucial in the grand scheme of things there's a couple more cars onto pit road that's a pure racing team white of course online six sideways i'm seeing Heusingfeld as well onto pit road but uh Sinteri is waiting patiently waiting for the fuel and tires to be done and it'll be all set to go 24.7 seconds on his pit stop there for Centauri. So uh, not a bad pit stop really. Other cars in that uh, in that category, they've been uh, going at about the same in the pit stops. But Thrust Aston Vivano, they're in the traffic here. They're in a bit of a traffic uh, black zone at the moment. And really it's not the sort of in-lap that they'd want to be getting uh, coming into the pits really, because you'd imagine that they're going to be coming into the pits this next lap or so. 
And you also have to look at this with the driver of Santeri Kekkonen. He's held up by Rene Kirchhoff of ACR Zaxby, who doesn't have to let him through. This is a battle for positions. They get past Nar Quinn of Targa Racing. So right now, Rene Kirchhoff, every right to fight for this position. Down to the inside as they head through the left and right. Santeri Kekkonen makes very light work of that move and a very, very accomplished move as well. So the question will become, Mavano have cleared the traffic. They've got around the likes of Hayden Birds, Arthur uh, Lehoke, and also the likes of Gianni Vecchio as well. Tommaso Carla able to go a lap longer here on this opening stint. And when you talk about margins here, Alvin, at the end, fuel will become a margin, tires will become a margin. And as they dive in, driver changes in this Daytona prototype become a massive margin. And that'll be one of the key things here for the Daytona prototypes, how to minimize the driver swaps. Because yes, we know that once you do the driver swaps at, in the Daytona prototype, it may cost you like, uh, like five seconds. So how to minimize those driver swaps? I think we are going to see some of the, so, uh, some of the DP teams are try, uh, trying to go three, maybe even four hours to try to minimize that time lost. Yeah, you certainly do. You see Tomasa Kala in his box. He hasn't changed driver at all. Here comes Kekkonen out of Sunset Bend on the concrete as he looks to make that run. And that's another point of contention I want to talk about in a little bit. But you see Kala waiting, waiting. Finally gets off, but goodbye. See you later. There goes Santeri Kekkonen. No opportunities to make anything happen. So it's as you were. But Paul, concrete to asphalt. It's such a difference in property. That's one of the most unique things that comes across with this circuit. It's such a bumpy circuit as this, uh, as this track. Of course, it is uh, an old airfield here. And uh, the mixture in surfaces, you've got to set the car up to be, uh, to be compliant over those bumps. If you have a car that's nervous, I mean, you look down into this hairpin, you go from tarmac down the straight into the braking zone, all of a sudden you're hitting concrete and then back up to tarmac again. It's those mixture of surfaces that really uh, test you as a driver around this track. And uh, it's all about your setup, all about getting the car right for the, uh, for the track and for how the drivers feel. And even going around here, you can see sort of how much rubber's getting put down so early on in this race. It's, Quite a warm track temperature, and there's the change of surface. Concrete Samak once again, and Kekkonen though is looking quick so far. Second lap on these tyres, and uh, you never know. We could see uh, could see some new fast laps getting set as we get further on in this in this race teams that haven't come in are the GT3 teams right now. They are in a fantastic scrap at the front of the field. One, two, and three are nose to tail. And when we saw what happened at the Bathurst 12 hour, Alvin, we saw just how aggressive drivers could be. We saw three wides almost. We saw drivers taking the gamble moves. In this race here at Sebring, it's been a completely different style of racing. It's been, let's build our gaps, and only when we feel comfortable to what track position shall we make that move. Down to the inside looks Tom Valentini in the gym racing GTR Center. Of course, that is a uh, deal that has almost all but buried GT Ross as a force in sim racing. I think we're looking right now here at a really mature battle, I think is the right word, between three of the greatest drivers that we have seen in sim racing for a while. And that is one of the key things on a, on a race like this. You have to be patient. Yes, from the dropout of the ring that you want to be racing, but you also have to pick your battles. And yes, we saw some teams are trying uh, not being that patient and we saw them paying the consequences, but fortunately, they're still running. It is a 12-hour race, so plenty of things can happen, yes, but it doesn't sit well when from the from, uh, from, from the get-go, you start being really aggressive on a race like this, it's not going to pay off. No, it's not, and this is a circuit that the moment you start stepping out of line, you start running into a few issues. This isn't a Herman Tilke design track here, uh, Paul. You know, it's grass if you run off wide. You are not going to stop with your brakes if you get out on that grass than half a tyre. That's it. You could be on the in the braking zone going into, say, for the example, this hairpin here, get a wheel on the grass, all of a sudden you're facing the wrong way with cars coming flying at you, and uh, you've just got to sit there and wonder, oh, right, uh, I've got to get this car spun around again. And uh, certainly that's what, uh, what the 
got to contend with here. Not no sort of tarmac runoff as you mentioned. And so uh, it's all about precision around this track. It's all about knowing which curbs you can use that don't unsettle the car. And really these drivers have got to work hard, work with the traffic as well. Because there's no point holding up somebody who's in a faster category than you. You can use them to help bring yourself for propel yourself forward if you if you let them through in the in the right manner. So uh, experience in these multi-class events will certainly pay off for a few of these drivers, but certainly uh, knowing how to use the traffic, knowing how to work the track. Don't get yourself involved in any shenanigans, especially like this exit curb here onto the back straight. It's all about not hitting that grass because that could suddenly send you veering off onto the inside wall. It certainly could, and we also saw at Tower Pool the fact that uh, we had uh, an Eric Andre go around the outside of Maran Cholak, which was never going to be the move that people wanted. And you see now Chris Santiso sort of in the middle of the pair of them to battle for second now will hot up in GT3. Ricardo Castroledo close to Patrick Pichler. He will look for the move in towards turn number one. I tell you what, let's go race bot TV fan immersion on the course sim racing machine. Ricardo Castroledo is desperate to get out of third position. Pretty comfortable lap from Ricardo Castroledo, but he struggled in comparison to 2031 compared to the 2024 of Patrick Pichler. The 2024 of Maran Cholak has dropped seven tenths of a second back on that last lap as the likes of Rene Kirchhoff makes his way through. As now Samuel Roth will want to get himself through as he gets stuck through the S's section of three, four, and five. Beautiful sweeping section of track, Alvin, that bit. But you always seem to feel that if you go too wide there, it always seems to end up with a few tears. It ends with a few tears because if you think about trying uh, trying to go into into turn number four, there is that big gigantic curb on the inside that really doesn't like to be touched at all, no matter what car you are. So trying to go too wide, you really have to think about it. And then when you consider you put that multi-class traffic in it, well, it's a little bit tricky, really interesting, and sometimes, yes, extra a lot of patience especially on a race like this and what i find very interesting right now is samuel roth is actually being defended uh, against by patrick pichler this one is for position of course red face had come down on the alternative strategy mind you for gte pool and patrick pichler does not want to see samuel roth go through does not want to give maran cholak the light of day of the gap and you can see he will fight it every single step of the way yeah but you, you find a losing battle there and sometimes it's almost worth just letting that car through using him using this slipstream to then pull himself forward towards that leader because he's going to uh, hold up 
that leader is what's going to happen here as Orion Racing have actually made their pit stop just about the hour mark coming up here so uh, right on time really for them to make their first pit stop in the GTEs so we're going to be seeing GTEs and GT3s coming onto pit road shortly you've got to think about the strategy you've got to think about your fuel and right now Patrick Pichler ok he's dropped back a little bit from his uh, leader of his category but right now the leader of the category is getting held up now because he's having a uh, enthusiastic Ferrari go past, shall we say. A very enthusiastic Ferrari, but no harm, no foul. They keep themselves going. And Alvin, when it comes to GTE, typically we've seen that be the category that goes the longest when it has come onto that strategy call. GT3 are good, but GTE may be just that little bit more effective when it comes to the fuel safe. It can be, and we also have to remember that the GT cars, they have some different fuel mix uh, settings that they can use as well. And that is something that they may be using to their advantage. For the GT3s, I think uh, for these cars, they really don't have that much variations when it comes to uh, what when it comes to fuel saving so it's just a matter of trying to run the race that you can and then the question is are you coming into the pits for fuel only or fuel and tires i think we've hit that sort of window jalvaz follow me esports on the lane gianni vecchio on the lane arthur lehoek down on the lane as is scott brazier as is martin skrzipczak mika, uh, mika nitimaki on the lane yoni hagner dives down pit stop party i have said it i will call it so we're seeing here on the hour there's two strategies at play paul you either go to the hour and pit on every hour or you go to the tank is pretty much dying and gasping for another little bit of sunoco fuel that's it and there's benefits to both strategies really I mean, with these gte cars now they can do the tires as well as fuel at the same time so uh, they don't have to worry about uh, about sort of the extra time it takes to put tyres on. You can put fresh tyres on every pit stop if you want. But the thing is, if you're doing it on the hour, you don't have to fill up the tank completely every pit stop. So that means that you're able to put in less fuel, you're spending less time on pit lane. Vice versa, if you're going to run it till the tank is empty, you're going to be spending the most time on pit road because you're filling up the car completely. But you will then have a shorter pit stop, a much shorter pit stop for your final pit stop. So it can kind of even out, and it just depends on what you as competitors, um, as a team, feel comfortable with running here today. It certainly does as we watch Maximilian Beneke look and dive down onto the lane, your leader in GTE, pure racing team, looking to prove that they are the strongest team in the world, and that is their one and only goal, and they will not have it any other way as he will search for his box, which will be about midway down pit road. He hits it, inch to perfection once again, and he will look to take the fuel, he will look to take the tyres, he will not look to make the driver change. Of course, Maximilian Venig and Jonas Volmeyer will be the two drivers who they can bring in at any given time. Also on the lane, Sindre Setsos, Jack Sedgwick, PJ Sturgis, Kei Kashube, Bo Albert, Sebastian Schmelenbach and Maran Cholak. So the leader came in, staying out in GT3 Alvin, Core Sim Racing, Pure Racing Team Red. And now here comes the interesting part here on the pit strategy. Are some of the teams going to change drivers or not? That's going to be pretty much one of the questions, but so far for Pure Racing and GT Blue, Maximum Be Maximilian Benecki and the in the number 71 Ferrari getting out of the pits. I think he's still on the lead. Let me try a, a quick cycle here on the live timing. And it looks like, well, no, he is right now out in P2. But the team hoisting belt, the number 35, I think they are going for the long stint here. Yeah, Jan Sienkowski is going for the long stint. And we've seen how far back they were in the early stages. So effective net lead right now for Maximilian Beneke. Worth noting where Esther Racing Team will come out in comparison. They get a little bit of clean air and Eric Andre will want to get past in the race clutch machine. But now the question becomes core and pure. What will they do? They both come down in at exactly the same time. Castro Ledo and Pichler. Who hits the box first will be also very interesting. Who stops on the brakes first? The answer is very clearly going to be Patrick Pichler in that situation. I even thought for just half a second that maybe Ricardo Castro Ledo would have overran his box pool. He oh, was perfect. We've, on the we've box. had an instant, and your race leader 
has dropped behind Thrustmaster Mavano. There's no uh, a SimRC.de car on the grass as well. Unfortunately, I can't go back to look at it. I don't know whether you two can at all, but Centauri Kekkonen now down to second place overall in this race. And it's not the first time that they've come together. They have history, and that goes back all the way to maybe a certain area, like, shall we say, Paul, uh, the likes of the uh, 10 hours of Suzuka that recently just happened. I think something like that may have a bit of influence, and they will be shouting at each other over it. It's, um, yeah, it's... <laughs> When you get history with somebody, you, you all of a sudden you, you, you seem to have a big bullseye on each other. And whenever you get anywhere near, all of a sudden the, you, you come together. It seems to happen cyclically um, with those types of things. But really, you know, when you've got two different classes getting involved in instance, you've got to look at maybe you know, whether there was a little bit of miscommunication between the two in that incident. And, um, yeah, certainly... Yeah, you don't like to apportion blame without looking at it, and unfortunately we can't look at it because of the technical problems we've been having today. So uh, we'll just have to, maybe if the uh, drivers want to come in and uh, uh, speak to us, then uh, by all means we'll give them the floor and let's hear their side of the story. And, and Alvin, I, I managed to get to chat with a couple of drivers from the SimRC team after the incident that happened at the 10 hours of Suzuka. And I, I think the underlying words that I got from them were, we are sick and tired of people making moves, starting to get us into incidents, because at the end of the day, it gets us down, it gets us, uh, you know, it gets us unhappy. And it also means that we're not in this situation uh, as things happen, as uh, I can't see it as I've had a couple of issues with my feed, but the back of a P3 in Daytona prototypes certainly going on at this stage. Well, and here's one of the problems. Yes, we have this race, and this is not the only race that these drivers go, uh, are going to see each other. We got a lot of races that they are going to be seeing each other throughout the whole year. And some things, yes, those little incidents that happen on previous races, they can fester. They can be carry on into the next races. And, well, sometimes we see those, uh, those incidents, those issues, they manifest in the worst ways that you can so don't be surprised if towards the uh, as this race go, uh, goes on some of those teams that we have seen be involved in incidents with each other we may see them tangle again uh yes we may uh we may think it's it's uh either retaliation it is shenanigans but well you know sometimes things happen and when those teams they keep getting into each other well it is just some it is just a matter of well, something really big happening. All battle in GT in uh, Daytona prototype, sorry, for position three. Yep, certainly is going on at the moment between uh, Pure Racing Team White, Patrick Wolf, and Radicals Online Six Sideways, Carly Janssen. Carl, a very competent, very fast driver indeed in that Radicals car, heading in towards this uh, tight right hander here. And uh, these two, they've been pretty close together, are that? Pure racing team, white cars just getting a little bit loose there. But uh, these cars really pushing the limits here, really pushing each other as well. They're into their uh, second stint here, of course. Lap nine is stint for both of them. And uh, certainly these two pushing hard, trying to get the, uh, get the positions and trying to get the job done here today. Battling between them at the moment. Staying behind those radicals online as they uh, go down the back straightaway here. Well, they, they, I, I think we've seen radicals online really be aggressive in races like these. They're not the best at qualifying, but they take advantage of the fact that this is a 12 hour race and you have time and space to breathe and make these moves as and when you need to. Let's not forget they started ninth when it came to this event. They are now up to third, but patch or up to fourth, sorry, looking at third. But Alvin Patrick Wolf so underrated like Patrick Pichler but Patrick Wolf I don't think really gives himself enough credit for just how good of a driver he is when it comes to prototype driving and sometimes when as a driver you start kind of underestimating yourself and I, I I think sometimes that is a good thing because coming into a race you don't have that high of the of expectations and then when you get the results that that you were not looking for, uh, meaning above what you were looking for, then it's kind of like, hey, you know what? Even though 
I think I am not able to do this. I still, I still did a good job. So you know, sometimes that is what, what sometimes that is what you need. Not trying, not not trying to be overconfident because sometimes being overconfident can be kind of detrimental at, as well. It certainly can. We've just had a lead change actually in your GT3 category. So Esther Racing Team, all of a sudden, do not have themselves in that position that they need to be overall. You've seen uh, the likes of uh, Patrick Pichler make that push forward, but sometimes it doesn't often happen the way that you think it does, Paul. And changes, of course, Sim Racing now, all of a sudden have the lead and have the lead by a fair margin. Yeah, well, Corp, they did have a shorter pit stop, so that little bit of a shorter pit stop there, uh, 1 minute 2.7 pit stop, so they took a full service on that pit stop there. Jumped them ahead of Marin Cholak, who is a 1 minute 7.2 on the pit stop there for himself. But he is running a little bit slower at the moment, as well as Cholak. Uh, in that second place, Esther Racing Team, and that last lap was about three tenths of a second slower. So little issues there for them down in second place, but don't pack it about it too much yet. Like I say, it was a longer pit stop that has aided uh, course in Racing to be able to get a jump ahead of Esther Racing Team. A short stop for track position. We have seen that often, and they are going to try and use that to their advantage, but 156.4 last time by from Vendaval Sim Racing. Compare that to the 57.1 that Tommaso Carla made. Half of the gap has been closed. It's down to seven tenths of a second. A bit of traffic there in the form of uh, Miko Nidimaki in the Black Star Racing Machine. So uh, they've got past Nidimaki. And now Kekkonen can start thinking about Tommaso Carla now once again for the second time in this event. And very similar in terms of an hour ago, Alvin. I think Vendaval want to lead this race from the front. They want to lead, but they got a long way to go if they if they want to do that, and it's going to be a really tough task uh, and and here today because with the level of with, with the level that we have in here today, you know these drivers they came in here to race. Yes, this may be a special event. The only thing that maybe for uh, for the winners may be pretty much bragging rights. Well. Back in the day, it used to be bragging rights, but I think now we got Sperry points as well. Oh, yeah, Sperry points are very important for a reason that I will not disclose at this stage in time. But right now, Patrick Wolf in position number three. He's got to worry about the Radicals on line six sideways machine. Carly Janssen still there waiting for that move. And the Swede, arguably the fastest Swede in sim racing right now, looking to get past Patrick Wolf and... Well, he'll have to just play the waiting game, maybe a chance into turn number one. The gap at the front of the field, that one comes down. Well, seven tenths of a second, now it's under half a second. And now you're starting to feel, Paul, that Vendaval are going to be eyeing up the move. Yeah, they certainly do. Look at that last three laps, point one and a half, point seven, call it, and point two faster than your race leader. So they've got the pace of Vendaval Sim Race in blue. But getting past for Sasna Ivana is going to be a very difficult job for them indeed because Tommaso Carla, very competent driver, very fast driver and an aggressive defender of the position as well. Uh, looking further back as well between Pure Racing Team White and uh, Radicals Online 6 Sideways, they've been pretty pretty even on, uh, on lap times these last few laps, so just keeping together for the time being between those two. They're quite close together, about three tenths of a second between them at the moment, but that's race lead that we'll just keep an eye on because those two, you, you imagine it's going to be putting the pressure on now for Santeri Kekkonen. You want to get that, uh, want to get that pressure on there and uh, get the move done, maybe not immediately, but want to get past sooner rather than later. Yeah, I definitely think they want that track position as they head through Bishop, this left-hander, on the brakes then into Le Mans, right, left and right onto the Ullman straight they will head, and suddenly Tommaso Carla is responding to Kekkonen. I wonder here, Alvin, if the, there is a dirty air effect that's coming into play, forcing Kekkonen back at this half a second gap where he can't really attack. And that'll be a really interesting thing now coming here in... Uh trying to see what position what he can do right now because uh, it is a really interesting part here in this race now we are into our number two pretty much so do you try to 
keep that gap, try to fight for that position. I think for Santari Kekkonen, I think what he is doing the right now, I think he is okay. There is no point in trying to fight for that position right now. It's just a matter of trying to keep your car clean, try to keep the concentration up, maybe wait for a mistake from the Trustmaster, from the Trustmaster Mivano Black car, and then that's when you go for that position. And don't get stuck behind David Alexi Jordan of Odox Motorsport. We've seen how he has been uh, one of the most consistent anchors, but a very deliberate anchor, I think is the right word to call David Alexi Jordan. He's not the quickest driver in the world. I'll be the first to say that, and he will be one of the first to say that. But he does a job. He keeps a vehicle on the island. Kekkonen drops back almost a second. Wolf still holds the position over Carly Janssen at this stage of the event. But pure racing team now, again, that gap over SimRC in GTE. It's Zhao Vaz now that needs to worry about things because once again, Follow Me Esports is losing positions. They got Esther in front, but now it's the battle against Bushfink as Brazier tries to go deep to the outside to try and make the move there, Paul. Yeah, certainly, you know, we just jump back there just to see that, and uh, he's looking busy, he's wanting to make that move, and wanting to make it stick very quickly as they're heading down towards turn number one, various lines into the corner, there's only really one line out of the corner, and that's the, uh, the issue that we generally have for turn number one, not making the move yet, it's got brazier, but it's certainly putting the pressure on now, and uh, yeah, Vaz is certainly feeling that pressure in that Ferrari, both Ferraris, of course, between these two, but uh, certainly some uh, really good efforts from these guys. Fourth and fifth are in their uh, category at the moment. One thing I will mention here, Jake, we've yet to have a retirement in this race. You stole my thunder. <laughs> you stole my thunder. You stole my lightning. You may as well steal the whole rain cloud as well while you're at it. Alvin, I think that's fantastic to see that we've got no retirement so far as Kei Kashube now in a little bit of a scrap there with Fulvio Barazzini. Barazzini will go through as a bit of lap traffic. And now Orion you're seeing here with Logical Vortex. This is a scrap just behind the Bushfink Follow Me Esports battle. Joel Guez and Vortex, they are perennial uh, underdogs, I think you could say, of Vortex. You know, they are not in that era where they are as strong as they once were back in IndyCar. And I think that they are starting to prove that their GT program is actually very, very strong. Little by little, you build your teams. And yes, it started with IndyCar for, 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 for Vortex Sim Racing. And now, you know, they started to become one of the reckoning forces here in the in the GT in the GT categories as well. But you know, it takes a little bit of time. Yes, they've been proven that they can race these these GT cars. But now we're talking. You gotta come against teams like Hoisting Bell Core Motorsports, Corsin Racing, VRS Coanda, and now the FAG2. You know, all these things that they have proven that they have what it takes to be in these categories. But for sure the Vortex Sim Racing, they have come here, they have proven that they can race with these teams as well. Yeah, and there's no slouch here, you're dealing with Fulvio Barazzini, he's a driver who has iRacing World Championship victories, albeit one of them was at the very much debated 2013 Indianapolis race that's happened, but Joel Guez, a half look down to the inside, a two-thirds look down to the inside, but never ever looked, Paul, like he was fully committed to the course. Yeah, certainly not, he's... Uh... He's making himself busy, that's for sure. He's getting in the face. And uh, just pictures there, just temporarily. I do apologise about these technical problems that we've been having today uh, with this race. But, you know, these drivers, they're, uh, they're pushing. They're, they're determined to get past. And, uh, well, here he comes now, down the inside into the hairpin. Surely this time he's got to make that move stick. He does, and Fulvio Barazzini, I think, let him go there. He made a big mistake through Big Ben. You never take that wide line, and suddenly he lost out, and he lost out in pretty spectacular fashion in comparison to Joel Guez. So uh, his real timing seems to be working very, very nicely. He seems to have himself back in play. Who else is back in play? Vendaval Sim Racing Blue. There again, Alvin, tucked up right on the rear as they make the run through Fangio now on the charge to Cunningham. Coming down the run into Cunningham, Santeri Kekkonen keeping a close eye there on on, on Tommaso Carla, but uh, I, Tommaso Carla kind of runs a, 
Perhaps a little bit too wide, and that may allow Santeri Kekunin to get a run here into tower, but it is a difficult place to do an overtake in here, so I think he's going to just stay behind. Now coming here into this, short straight in into the king but there is traffic in front and that may play a big factor pj sturgis in front he stays all the way on the inside and and tomas ocarla goes into the inside so does santeri kekonen yeah both of them negotiating pj sturgis very well and you can see just how aggressive tomas ocarla is being there's not much you can say for santeri kekonen in that situation he was so much more shallow and yes you can get that argument paul that the white line is finite and final if you don't get an off-track incident point and you use that to your advantage if all drivers go off the circuit and extend there why wouldn't you not use it absolutely you know, use everything that you can use legally within what the iRacing system allows you to and uh, that's what these drivers do some of them do uh, push the look a little bit maybe and uh, go that little bit too far but uh, most of them using what they can do that's what testing is all about it's not just about getting the setup right it's about learning what's the best way and the fastest way to go around this track it's all about uh, minimizing the angle of the corners giving it the lead, uh, angle of least resistance for these cars and that's certainly what these guys are doing here we have a bushlink yellow have uh, been trying to get with uh, Frostwasser Mavano. Oh, they've got a car around in the middle of the uh, last corner. Van Devil Sim Racing Black. Unfortunately, we won't be able to bring you a replay, but there, they're stuck on the inside. They're waiting for traffic to get past, get a gap in the traffic so they can maybe reverse it back. Maybe worth them just taking a tour there and they've taken out one of the uh, Sim RC cars. It may be worth taking a tour back to the car and they've thrown, yep, they're out. Yeah, and the SimRC.de Florida machine, it's not the first time they've been involved with the Vendaval machine. They were involved with the Vendaval prototype, now with the Vendaval GT3 effort. And I have to say, SimRC would have seen that vehicle slow when it came to the relative, Alvin. They would have known that there is a vehicle stopped somewhere on circuit. Yes, that part of the track is blind, but you saw 20 vehicles go past without any issues at all. It was Dustin Hickman not having the... the foresight i think is the right word to see that where hayden burns could be out on circuit and then the other thing we also have to think about this is a team race so i think it also pays off to have somebody as a spotter trying to look out for you if things are going in front perhaps he didn't have a spotter at the moment and well that's what that's that's pretty much what happened right there yes you got a yellow flag it tells you to slow down but did but then the other thing going into sunset bit and it's gonna apply so you're kind of guessing where the car may be and a little bit of battling in gt3 right now srt sport green alessandro bachelega uh, with luigi nespolino going through the two italians going at it that's different categories and now jack sedgwick wants to get through he almost made contact there with bachelega and it's different categories uh, potentially a little bit but sedgwick in that same class looking to make that move looking to go through and well jack sedgwick had a chance and it's uber defensive line from srt tracks out to the middle of the road sometimes the easiest way to defend to the outside goes jack sedgwick as he looks for the move and they'll stay paul like this for now the nose is chopped yeah absolutely that's the thing with that hairpin is that little uh, it tight nips up on the exit and you've got that left right and uh, there's only really one line through there and you can't go too wide through that hairpin and uh, certainly this is trying to get in Cedric and it's just slowing each other down here they've got cars trying to put laps on them as well coming through here so certainly not going well for Cedric for uh, Sim uh, in X Racing Red but uh, they're trying their best to get back with that SRT eSport green car half a second between them at the moment heading in towards that back straightaway but at the moment it's that SRT eSport green car that's got the edge over them but Jack Sedgwick doing all he can to try and get through but he's got to get that GTE car out of the way first. Yeah he certainly will have to get the GTE car negotiated first. Giuseppe Iannucci will go down to the inside will look to take the position and he does just about get the lap and he'll be very happy about the way he has done the gap slightly opening again 
for Thrustmaster Mavano. We've said so often they are so good at negotiating their way through the traffic. They put three tenths of a second on and now two vehicles in between. One Samuel Roth, one K Kashubi right now here, Paul. Yeah, certainly um, getting that traffic to help them out. I'm still looking at this GT3 battle at the moment as they're coming through turn one. And Jack Sedgwick is trying to take advantage of the prototypes coming up to make the laps. And Inex finally making that move there. Good, good thinking there from Jack to use those prototype cars to their advantage and to get that position up. And it was those two battling prototypes for third place. Patrick Wolf and Kali Jensen and uh, Vanderveld. Really drop back here now. They're 1.3 seconds behind from your lead. That tells you what that traffic has done. But this traffic, it'll, it'll ebb and flow throughout this race. So, uh, you know, Van Devel, there maybe won't be too concerned at this moment in time. It's more towards the end of the race where traffic really becomes that issue. And, and traffic is exacerbated, Alvin, when you have more vehicles out on the road. Do you feel that... Um, you know, it's sort of a double-edged sword, the fact that we want all the vehicles out on track, but by the same point, we also want to be able to see battling that isn't too much affected by the lap traffic? Well, it is kind of like a really balancing it. If you are the faster driver, yes, you want to be in front, you want to have as much clean air as possible, but also you want to make sure that when you hit that slower traffic, you hit it at the right position. There is nothing worse than as the as the faster driver getting caught in between the the slower traffic at the worst of moments, namely say that twisty that twisty section from two three four here at Sebring, you really don't want to get caught into slower traffic. Then going from Cunningham into Tower, you don't want to get caught into slower traffic as well. So it's really trying to pick your battle. Sometimes yes, it will happen. It is part of multi-class racing. It is part of multi-class racing indeed. Core Sim Racing are starting to extend the gap, Paul, in GT3. Ricardo Castroledo pulled out four tenths on that last lap on Cholak and Pichler. And I think that they've got the message. It's hammered down. It's now time to do qualifying laps. Yeah, I mean, we saw... We saw uh, Core Sim Racing in the uh, VRS iRacing GT Series. Uh, last week did a very good job of towards the end of the race just putting in lap after lap after lap and they only ended up about one tenth of a second slower than the fastest lap overall so we know that castroledo has got the pace they're learning this car all the time as well and it's good to use this venue to learn that car because uh, well it's, it's it's a good little mix of of track here you've got the bumps you've got high speed corners you've also got low speed corners and a couple of uh, medium length straights so certainly great little mix there to be able to to work through and uh, to try and sort of learn the car and certainly it's a, a great place to uh, to be able to to move forward and progress your knowledge in that car I believe we're seeing an issue right now with the CTC Racing Red Machine of Nuno Marrera. He's had a really horrible 5-6 corners. He's dropped about 20 vehicles, and I think he does have some very uh, substantial damage on that machine. And it's a shame to see it. I think it's going to have to be a lengthy stop right now, Alvin, for the 26 machine. Definitely a lengthy stop right there for car number 26. It kind of seems like, uh, you know, things... Things kind of do happen, and well, sometimes you just gotta deal with it. The good thing about it, well, it is a 12 hour race, so just because you got a long, lengthy stuff, that doesn't mean it is the end of the race. You still, the, you still have plenty of time to go, plenty of things can happen. We have seen this time after time after time in this race, especially just because you are leading at this time, doesn't that doesn't guarantee you anything. And about two years ago, Paul, you would say exactly that same thing about Maximilian Benecke. Here was oh, a drive. Oh, Sebastian Schmellenbeck put around at turn number one. We just caught that one. He was battling with David Williams in the VRS Quinter Simspot car. And around he goes. I think Williams just got caught out by Schmellenbeck having to get on the brakes a little bit earlier than you would imagine into turn one. And that just turned him round. Look at that pure racing team. Black car didn't end up in the wall there. So big drama for pure racing team, but they have dropped down three positions now and that down to eighth place from fifth. Well, that's certainly woken me up. Sebastian Schmalen back, a driver who has a lot of experience at pure racing team, starting to feel the effects of other drivers getting a little bit involved. And David Williams, 
is not that sort of driver, Alvin, who normally gets involved in incidents like this. He's normally the consistency man who brings the vehicle home, who always puts himself in a situation to score the vital points and is very Jensen Button-esque in the way that he drives. That was not a move that we normally get to see out of David Williams. It also gets to show you that even to the best hunters, the hair can get away. And that's pretty much what happened there to David Williams in the VRS on the Audi. Yes, you know, it, it also kind of shows you that, yes, at, at, the end, uh, at the end of the day, we are humans and sometimes we can make mistakes. You know, this is racing and sometimes when it is as close as this, some, so, uh, some of these things can happen. Fortunately for car number 73, for Sebastian Challenbeck, he didn't hit the wall, so it was just a hit on the rear end, but no hitting of the wall, and that is really important because that means that in terms of damage, pretty much there is minimal, if any, at all. But Paul, let's track back a little bit because I was going to talk about Maximilian Beneke. How has Beneke in the last two years developed his game so that he has become one of the most consistent drivers in the world? Oh, we've seen him uh, in the, uh, well, really, really came to our attention, was the uh, iRacing VLN series, really, wasn't it? That he really, the Pure Racing team in particular really took advantage of that series to really enhance their uh, abilities and talent and endurance and multi-class racing. And Maximilian Beneke especially has really shone out there and really improved his consistency in lap times and his ability of keeping that top pace for long triple stints even quadruple stints at times he's progressed on moved up into sort of world championships and moved up into uh, the world championship uh, the vrs i racing world championship series uh, but certainly he's really progressed a lot and it's all about those little things. It's all about working on your consistency, working on setups, working on uh, how you approach a race, maybe even doing a few things that we've seen a few drivers in sim racing do. Pay attention to the diet, getting fitness, looking after themselves. Because if you're sat down and running for three, maybe four hours, that's a long time to be focused, a long time to be working the wheel. And physically, it can be exhausting by the end of a stint, uh, by the end of a, a four stint run as we've got the battle for the third place overall going on still. Yeah, we certainly do. Carly Jansen maybe had half an opportunity on Patrick Wolf on that lap. Joel Guez had a big wiggle heading through Le Mans, so that allowed the driver of Carly Jansen to close it down for the Radicals Online six sideways machine. And well, now Pure Racing Team have to be very, very cautious about what can happen from that number 11. We've seen, Alvin, how Carly Anson can be this driver who can play the patient game, who can sit and who can wait. But we also know that Carly Anson can flip a switch and if the gap is half a jar, or if the door is half a jar, then he will go straight through it, even if he gets the bucket of water on his head. It certainly is, and you know, he can be patient, yes, but if he sees a gap, he's pretty much go with the with that with the so famous Ayrton Senna quote: "If you if if you see a gap and you don't go for it, you are no longer a race car driver." But for Carly Jensen right now, it is pretty much try to stay behind, try to get patience. We are still long ways to go from the end of this race, so there is no point in trying to push it. Well, we're about 10 minutes, Paul, from the prototype stopping distance. So I, I think if you're Carly Anson now, do you sit and wait until the stops? Yeah, sit behind, save that fuel. If you feel confident that you've got the pace, you would make the move. But right now, you're looking at the timings and say, right, we've got to come up towards the end of our stint. Let's just hang here, wait for a pit stop. We'll be quicker in the pit stop because we don't won't have to put in as much fuel as the car in front. I make the jump in the pit stop. That, that's what strategy is all about. And uh, we've seen it work time and again, just sitting behind your rival, sitting behind your compatriot in that other car really does help you in the longer run to make that one position here. And uh, this is the thing about endurance racing. It's all about that, it's that long game. It's that mentality of th not thinking two, three corners ahead. It's thinking of two, three hours ahead. Uh, maybe even, as we see, ten and a half hours ahead towards the end of the race. 
Yeah, and drivers will not be setting goals. They will be setting their intention. My intention is to be, for example, if you're Santeri Kekkonen and Vendaval Sim Racing Blue, my intention is to get in front of Thrustmaster Movano before the next stop. If that doesn't happen, my intention is then to get past Movano after this stop. You know, you, you don't play a game of a goal because if you fail your goal it becomes very negative as a concept i think that a lot of drivers alvin especially when you talk about a uh, developing series like this how that you can argue that there isn't maybe uh, the psychological presence there is in comparison to real racing i think that it's keeping in that positive mindset that a lot of drivers need to be able to have the skill and that is one of the big things that that does separate real life from the from the virtual you know there are some things that no matter how much we progress and we advance up perhaps we won't be able to replicate but it still provides a good platform here sim racing to try to get those skills try to work them up i i think i kind of talked about this before yes well it may not be the same but the fact that you can get in the car in the track as close as it is to the real life as possible you can work maybe 75 to 80 some may even say up to 90 percent of those skills that you need to be on the track the other 10 well is that 10 percent that you cannot have in the virtual world and you have to be on the real life yeah, you certainly have to. Battle going on further down in GT3, though. Simicube Inex Racing Blue, number 12 machine against Triton Racing 12 Hour, the 88. It's Martin Skajipzak against PJ Sturgis right now, Paul. And we've seen how Triton Racing have been a little bit hit and miss over the past six months or so. They've had monumental highs. For example, they got themselves on the podium at the 12 hour, at the uh, 24 hours of Spa last year. But you look at them now, and you see them in the middle of the pack, and there haven't been any retirements. They haven't been able to capitalize that way. They're still scrapping for a good top 10, but what do they need to kick on forward? I think they just need more experience in these uh, in these types of events. Getting themselves into world championships certainly helps as well. And uh, you know, we've certainly seen that uh, they're able to do that as well. So it's certainly helping them getting involved in that world championship for them to get that experience of working against the best. But working in these in these types of endurance events, these special events will help them gather that experience they need a couple you know, maybe a couple more drivers of similar qualities as well to come in and uh, consolidate that team's position and to really help them develop because the more people that have that ability to be able to develop the setups develop each other as drivers really will help them push them forward to the next level as we see a couple of the prototypes now starting to come into pit road for their second stops so the prototype division then decides that they want to come down and start thinking about making the pit stop window a reality. On the lane already we have the Dave Kamey Massive Wall of Text Model V7 uh, right, right now is on that lane. So they are one of the first to dive down in. Are there any takers? Yes, Vendaval Sim Racing Blue is a taker. They will come down on the lane as expected. Movano will stay out. Now this is the next question, Alvin. Will it be one lap? Or will it be two from Thrustmaster Movano? Well, from what I have in here, pretty much we've seen most of the teams trying to go for 25 laps. We have a couple of teams trying to go for 26 laps in here as well. The Pure Racing Team White and the Radicals Online 6 sideways. So that's the really interesting thing here. How many laps can you go on one tag of fuel? Well, we know that for now, Santeri Kekkonen, he can go for 25 laps for sure. And it looks like he is staying on the car for one more stint. One more stint then for Santeri Kekkonen. That does not surprise me. He could choose to go three hours or even four hours. But it's that sort of ideal uh, situation that you look at, Paul, when you look at a driver, how long do you keep a driver in that vehicle? Because at some stage, tiredness will become a factor. And it will mean that they are more liable at some stage to crash the car. That's why I was so upset with Pure, say, in the VLN, when they would push Beneke for a fourth stint. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all about how comfortable you feel working those uh, longer stints as Kekkonen it is out the pits now, 24 and a half second pit stop. It's, it's all about what they feel that they can do as a team and what they feel they can do 
individually as well. And it's also how strong the feel that the the teammate is. And uh, certainly as uh, Delta iRacing team prototype of a change of driver on pit road at the moment, your prototypes. But really, it's, it's all about... They'll, they'll have tried this in practice. They'll have seen... You know, so how comfortable do you feel in the car? Do you feel sort of that tiredness coming on? Do you feel you could go in for stint? And if the driver says yes, and they're, and they're comfortable with that, then they'll keep the driver in because it's limiting the amount of times that they're coming to the pits. And Tommaso Carla, speaking of the pits, is on pit road. He is, and he was a little bit held up through Sunset, and he decided to make the dive there. We also noted Vendaval Sim Racing really struggled to get past Jim Racing GTR Center. They had a bit of contact coming out of the hairpin. So Valentini and Kekkonen came together. There was no spins. There was nothing of that sort. As also diving down onto the lane, you see Patrick Wolf. You see Carly Janssen. Janssen was the first man onto his box. Also down in is a certain team, Hoixingberg. Christian Kiewit uh, was behind the wheel of that one. The question becomes, where is Vendaval? The answer is rounding Sunset Bend. Where is Movano in comparison? Just leaving the box right now. They will get up onto the power. They will be on the outside through turn number one. And has there been a substantial jump? In fact, the gap has increased. And there's two vehicles, Alvin, now in between the pair. Look further behind as well. Wolf still stays ahead of Janssen. And this kind of shows you the timing of the pit stops. Vendaval Sim Racing Blue, they came one lap early, and I think the traffic that they have been, that they've had to battle, that has played a huge factor in in this gap that they have to deal with right now. But on the other hand, Tommaso Carla also into heavy traffic, and I think this may help Santeri Kekkonen in the long run. It may very much do. You can see just in front of Carla, Fulvio Barazzini, big, big cut there from the driver of Carla to get past his Italian comrade in Barazzini. He'll then have Maran Cholak, the Croatian, arguably the greatest Croatian ever to hit iRacing, to try and get past. That's going to be a challenge to deal with. And suddenly that gap really does shrink as Barazzini will then lose the position. Cholak's not going to let it go through. And just like that, a gap which at the start of that pit stop window looked like a second, maybe two. Suddenly for Santeri Kekkonen as he runs a bit wide out of tower, becomes a one car gap and becomes a very easy and manageable task here, Paul, for him to chase down. Yep, certainly is. He's compromised into that right left up. Uh, is Kekkonen, but he's uh, right there with the race leader. Certainly uh, giving it an effort, giving it a go, trying to take advantage, of course. No tyre warmers for these uh, Daytona prototypes, so uh, they've got to warm up the tyres out on this lap, and this is the uh, ideal lap for him to try and catch that time up, but uh, Tommaso Carla getting ahead of lap traffic, running a bit wide through a sunset bend, but that doesn't matter too much, because if you carry that speed all the way out of the exit, down the pit straight, and uh, that's certainly going to help him there as we've got more cars coming onto pit road as well. Jim Racing, GTR Centre are on pit road. You'll, you'll imagine Zach Speed, ACR and Zach Speed will come to pit road this time by as well. So that would be the last of your Daytona prototypes to hit the pit lane. Yeah, it certainly should. Rene Kirchhoff then will be the last driver. He's got Pablo GoPro Lopez, who's moved from Iberica to Teo Martin Esports then in their own little scrap. And GoPro is going to decide that he doesn't want to make the move. Of course, with Vodafone sponsorship there, Teo Martin Esports in dives down the Zach Speed sponsored Avid Chronic Racing Machine of Rene Kirchhoff. They hold some very, very quick drivers on different platforms. The likes of Mishi Hoya is one of those drivers who you always talk about as being one of the best sim racers in the world. Rene Kirchhoff down onto the lane. He looks for his box. Will there be a driver change, though, for Kirchhoff? Of course, a former playing Ducks racing machine driver. Answer's going to be no for now. He's going to stay in that vehicle. Is he? No, he's going to change. Patrick Jetski is going to come in behind the wheel here, Alvin. Yeah, getting some getting some new drivers in here yes they they are going to lose around maybe five to six seconds because of the driver stop and that is one thing if you are in the daytona prototype that you are trying to minimize that time loss in the pit stop due, due to driver swaps and you know speaking about the daytona prototypes right now in p6 that tail martin esports with with pablo lopez which we saw them being involved in that lab one turn one incident and that kind of shows you 
this race being so long that you can still make those positions back you still need to not give up and well just try to keep your uh, try to keep your patience Keep your nose clean is the option that everyone needs to choose. We're going to step aside for one moment, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be back with more here of the Sebring 12 hours on iRacing after this.
Welcome back to the Sebring 12 hours here on iRacing Live and Racebot TV. Thank you very much for joining us here. It has been a really interesting first couple of hours here. We're coming up to the hour mark in this one. And well, the battle for your race lead is certainly on here today. I'm Paul Smith alongside me, Alvin Nieves, and I'll hand you over to your lead commentator, Mr. Jake Sperry. Thank you, Paul. Hashtag do you mind? The observer of sim racing sees all and sees Vendaval sim racing back within three tenths of a second. Traffic up in front is the uh, University oh. Isabella first machine. And Paul, you've seen something. And Eric Andre has been almost into a wall there uh, around the back end of the circuit. And I'm trying to see if he's got any front end damage. Slight front end damage, but the thing with this Daytona prototype, you can change that front clip. So if uh, if it's not uh, a meatball flag damage, then at least he'll be able to carry on to the pit stop and get that repaired then. And meatball damage is damage that is too much for the iRacing system to like. They say come down, you need to serve your damage. You are a danger to other drivers out on circuit. More stopping then for Frostmaster Mavano. They've got uh, Michael Schotler they were trying to get through. They just about negotiate that as they head into Cunningham Corner, the next right-hander. It's been fantastic, Alvin. It's been back and forth between them all race long so far, and the rivalry only goes to continue. And let's not forget, this is both a Vendaval and a Thrustmaster Mavano that are not fielding their strongest sides today. And that is one of the really interesting things in here today. Yes, we talk that usually on special events, some of the very some of the strongest drivers may not uh, may not be in here today trying to focus the, their efforts onto the more important races. Not that this is not important, but you know, for some drivers as they go now here into the almonds right now, Tommaso Carla going into the left, trying to block Santeri Kekonen, but Santeri Kekonen goes into the inside, going side by side here on the almonds straight. They may have some traffic ahead, but it's not going to be a big deal now. So Santeri Kekonen with kind of easy makes it into the lead but Tommaso Carla taking a bit of a wider line let's see if he can get a run here into the start finish straight and the waiting game was there from Tommaso Carla the gap was open for Kekkonen he took it and Carla knew that he was not going to be able to defend much longer no point in defending that much longer as such they hold positions right now behind that we've almost got side by side Carly Anson looking for the move on Patrick Wolf but is not finding the opportunity to make that happen and well it seems Paul at the moment that prototypes are looking very interesting the gap between now what is P2 and P3 has now come down under 10 seconds yeah 10 second gap between the uh, pure racing team and Thrustmaster Mavana but these two they've been battling away of radicals and pure racing team and I think now Carl Janssen he'd have hoped to have got the jump in that last pit stop but unfortunately it's not worked out for him so he's got to try and make the move on track here and he needs to make that move sooner rather than later because he do feel he's just got the slight edge there over Patrick Wolf. look at him he's all over the back of Wolf here trying to make the moves but for the time being not able to get by for down into this hairpin he's going to stick behind for the time being but uh, Cal Janssen does look a little bit of a quicker driver in that uh, radicals online six sideways car and whilst overall pace is one trait that I think everyone looks at, everyone says the stopwatch doesn't lie, if you're unable to make an overtake, Alvin, you know, it's so good having that pace, but if you have to keep conserving it, then how good is having overall pace? Well, for a race like this, you really have to balance up being on pace versus being, uh, versus being aggressive. And that is one of the beauties here on multi-class racing and on a race that is 12 hours like this one that we are in here today. You really have to be patient as the, uh, as we got this battle here for P number three trying to get some Luzon GT3 traffic. Patrick Wolf trying to go to into the outside uh, just be, just before coming into Sunset trying to go around that Team Hoising build. Mercedes, but it kind of looks like it's not going to be possible. And Carly Jensen trying to get a really aggressive there just behind Patrick Wolf. Yeah, he was trying to steal the draft away from Michael Schotler to give himself maybe a little bit of a run on Patrick Wolf. They got Giovanni Tognoni in the Wave DRS GT3 machine. Of course, Wave Driving Revolution, a team that has been winners in the past at Sebring over the course of 12 hours. It's a shame to see them a little bit further down than what many people would consider them capable 
of being able to do. But let's talk then GTE for the moment because it is Maximilian Benecke. It is pure racing team out and away and out and away by a country mile at this stage, Paul. Yeah, certainly 17 seconds. They've got a lead there, Maximilian Benecke. Over that CMLC, Dr. E. Bavaria, Carl Giovanni Vecchio uh, at the wheel of that one. Really, Benecke has just been a class of the field so far in this one. He's, he's worked well with, with traffic. He's worked well with uh, making his way through, making the strategy work as well. He just seems to be in tune with that Ferrari 488 GTE car. Yeah, he certainly does. We did see a spinner, actually, just behind Gianni Vecchia. That was the Targa racing machine of Niall Quinn. So uh, that's a GTE spin and didn't collect anybody in the process. So uh, no real harm, no real foul in that play. GT3, though, arguably has been some of the most interesting racing we've seen for a while. Ricardo Castroledo has really put his head down over the last stint, stint and a half. And we're seeing, Alvin, now that Core are absolutely dropping Esther and Pure, who are in their own little scrap for second right now. Yeah, it pretty much uh, it looks right now, right there, that Corsen Racing doing what they need to do. The, the gap right now to P2 in Esther Racing with card number three, right now, almost 17 seconds. So right now, Ricardo Casolero doing what he needs to do right now, trying to put that pressure, trying to keep on that pace, trying to open the gap as much as possible and really interesting for the gt3 cars we've seen uh for p1 p2 p3 p4 and maybe even all the way to p5 i'll say pretty much the whole gt3 field we haven't seen any driver swaps yet on this class so one when they come into the pits when are they going to swap the drivers and who is coming into the perhaps that middle part otherwise because that will be one of the big talking points in here as well once you are into the metal part there's really not much racing going on so it's, it's pretty much trying to strategize to try to go to the end strategizing to go to that end of course you talk about a, a game plan you're always looking to try and execute that and paul i have to say it had to have been an excellent game plan on the part of course sim racing to go for track position because as we've seen right now, when Esther and Pure have got together and decided to scrap it out a little bit, that's where they've built their gap. And suddenly, even with that longer stop, I still think Core Sim Racing is going to come out in the lead. You would imagine so, with the way that they've been going and the, uh, the speed that they've got over those two behind. And the thing is, with those two behind, they're fighting. They're, they're competing with each other as uh, CTC Red has had an issue at the last corner along with uh, Dave Cambers massive wall of text model V7 oh and another car as well up and over Delta I racing team prototype involved in that I believe big instant down at the last corner they're on pit road and there's a car upside down that's a prototype as well absolute disaster and it was that CTC racing black car it was, yeah, the red and the black are both on the lane. So Ove Trengarade has been caught out. And then Quentin Cornelius Clapp also getting involved in a major, major incident. And Delta as well. That's pretty much, in that one situation, three of your lower end uh, prototypes all getting caught out in the blink of an eye, Alvin. Yeah, it certainly is, and that is one of the things that you can have in here. You can be having a good race for a good race for, for pretty much from the drop of the green flag, and we are almost at the end of our number two, and, and then all of a sudden, the smallest of slips happen, and it can turn into a nightmare. Car off Bo Albert, Evolution Racing Team 225, and that's going to hurt ERT. They wanted big points. They're second in I rankings in terms of the teams. That's going to put them pretty much day done, and Bo Albert will be very furious at the way he's driven, Paul. Yeah, well, they're, uh, they're on pit road now, so uh, that's pretty much... Uh lean well i mean it's nicely timed if you're gonna have an instant you do it at this time because you're right on sort of a pit window here so at least they're onto pit road and uh and getting a service done here but bo albert will be uh, absolutely spitting feather, feathers with uh, with his uh, performance here today it's not been um not been the best day for that evolution racing team car the 225 and they're on pit road at the moment getting that service done a little bit damage at the rear as well and uh, unfortunately not able to uh, show replays, guys. Uh, I know a few of you have been asking 
Uh, but uh, unfortunately, a few technical problems mean that we're not able to show you replays today. So, um, very much uh, having to just sort of describe the best that we can with the incidents that are happening. And uh, we've seen a couple of big incidents today. Uh, only though in the last 10 minutes or so, even the last five minutes, Alvin, I think that suddenly uh, a race that has been very clean, very effective, suddenly has been supercharged with a, a lot of issue here and there. And suddenly, Thrustmaster Mavano are three seconds back after doing a 157. Suddenly, Paul, sorry, I'll go to you on this one. Suddenly, Thrustmaster Mavano have given advantage uh, to Vendival after losing two seconds on that last lap. Yeah, and uh, we'll, we'll get it up on uh, screen here just to show the uh, the differences in lap times there. So that last lap, 1.995 seconds, best part of two seconds there, slower than the Vendival Sim Racing blue car. And that Thrustmaster Mavano car just doesn't seem to quite have the pace and uh, as the leader at the moment but of course it is a long race we've just gone over the hour mark so we're into hour three already can't believe it we're already into hour three here it's been uh, an enthralling race so far as this one certainly action packed from behind the cameras as well but uh, yeah losing that time there it's, it's not been best for uh, Thrustmaster Mavano and that's really costing them an opportunity here but the track might develop it might move to suit their uh, their setup as they go further into this race and uh, you never know they're not out of this one yet and i've just seen dave Kamara's massive wall of text model try and get out of pit road and uh, subsequently fail so uh, they're pretty much going to be done uh, matthias egger now behind the wheel of the ryan race team hpp machine the number six they've come down in for a stop it seems though alvin that they've been there for a very long time it kind of seems indeed, but that, uh, that but we are in to that portion for the end of our number two, pretty much at the beginning of our number three, that most of the GTE and perhaps even that GT3 cars will start coming into the pit. So now it's more of a question of when you come into the pits, will you be changing drivers here as well? And for the GT3 cars, because this is our number two, so we know that some teams perhaps they have gone for, for two stints on the same tire so are they going to triple stint or are they going to change tires that's going to be a question Gianni Vecchio is out on the lane Scott Brazier is down on the lane so it's now about who decides to make that best stop the way that they know that they have to in this situation and I have to wonder right now for simrc.de as they get out and away what they need to doing at this stage Emanuele Petri behind the wheel of the Logical Vortex Sim racing 12 hour effort and you can see that although that they've come out in some pretty nice clean air here Paul have Gianni Vecchio Sim RC machine they are still a mile away from that pure racing team GTE of Beneke yeah uh, Beneke yet to go on to pit road for this stint but uh, it's, it, it's a case of well all about uh, working that strategy, working the fuel, working the numbers, trying to keep the pace up. But uh, Beneke has had such a dominance over this uh, GTE field at the moment. It'll be interesting to see whether Pure Racing Team keeping him in for a third stint here today or whether he will jump out of the car at this stage. Don't forget racebot.tv forward slash time and keep up to date with everything that's going on here. And if you do want to get social with us, there's information on there. And of course, use the hashtag iRacingSebring12H to get in touch with us on the, uh, on the Twitter or on Facebook as well. Yeah, always an option here. Get social with us on social media. The battle for position number three overall still there. It's still waiting here. Radicals versus Pure. And Carly Janssen still having to play that waiting game. That was as close as about a tenth and a half behind a couple of laps ago, Alvin. He now wants to get on that offensive push, but it just seems that Patrick Wolf has the counter at every given point. Lewis Goodway then for Team Bushfink, uh, powered by a Craig Dock is what they have to be very, very careful of. And certainly is now coming here into the hairpin. Patrick Wolf trying to trying to contend with a slower car here. That is the last place that if you are Patrick Wolf, you want to be catching the slower traffic there. But kind of seems like it's going to be no problem coming here. 
into into Cunningham, it's going to be no problem. But Carly Jensen closing little by little as well. He's trying to put the uh, he's he's been on the offensive here for pretty much this whole stint. Let's see if he if he wants to go for P3 or if he wants to wait for another round of pit stops and perhaps there that's where he's trying to or to or to overtake the pure racing team white well i mean esports then comes out of pit road after they've made their stop they've now got ricardo ferreira behind the wheel the ex radicals online driver so they've made their stop also coming out of pit road is pablo araujo of target racing so we're starting to see certain teams dive down in david williams one of them for the vrs coanda simsport team the number 18 they come in from fourth position on the road so they've been making good progress here as they dive down in esther racing team have certainly uh, dropped down the order they came in last time by to make that stop maran cholak uh, was still behind the wheel which has released Patrick Pichler at the front because we've also seen uh, I believe the likes of course sim racing uh, have dived down onto the lane now that's Santeri Kalunki uh, behind the wheel and behind Esther Racing Paul yeah uh, just bringing that up here so yeah Esther Racing jumping them in the pit stop but of course that driver change has made the difference so Maren Cholak was a 59.4 second pit stop for them for Esther Racing, whereas Course in Racing, a 1 minute 21 pit stop. So maybe getting a little bit of uh, damage repaired on that car as well, but certainly a driver change. But when you look at them on the track, they're not that far between each other. So uh, really, Course in Racing, I mean, they're there, they're just coming into turn one now. There's only four and a half seconds between them and Esther Racing. So that just tells you the gap that they were able to build over Esther Racing, that they then lost the best part of, what, 22 seconds in the pit stop, and they're only four and a half seconds behind. Yeah, that certainly shows you quite a bit. I will say something, Paul, though. How much do you like your volleyball? Volleyball? Volleyball. Uh, what, with how sandy it's getting offline on the track? No, with the fact that we are blessed to have a volleyball uh, professional in the race that we've got right now in Coanda's Rocco Barone. Oh uh, yes, of course. Uh, I was thinking where you were going with this uh, because quite frankly no one wants to see me in just a pair of uh, volleyball shorts. But um, yeah, uh, Rocco Barone, he is uh, in the car now, changed to driver uh, David Williams stepped out of that car. So we're just in that pit stop phase. In fact, I was in belt uh, car motorsport spot, Kate Schubert pit road as well and uh, i've just nicely put a uh, mental image in everybody's head yeah and that's something that people aren't going to get out then for the next two hours or for the next hour or so that we are going to be live on air but uh, pure racing team have come in they've come out and they've got themselves uh, a pretty substantial gap i think over simrc is the right wording that we're going to say in this situation it's also worth talking about PRT Red and where they are looking to come out then in comparison to some of their rivals and with them not making that stop so far Alvin I think Pure Racing Team Red need to be in this position where they need to work out what their strategy is because right now I have no clue if they're going to come out with Esther Racing behind them or in front. Well, that is pretty much uh, something that we need to keep an eye on when it comes to strategy. As we got the battle here between SimRC.de and the uh, BRS Kwanda since we're going into Sunset Bend, uh, it looks like the that like the CNC uh, SimRC.de was able to get in front. So that is good to see in here as well. Well, actually, never mind. It wasn't really a battle. It was just a GTE card coming in. It's just that. Well, we, we got the Ferrari GTE and the GT3. They look so similar in some things. I can get confused my bad on that. But just David Willis just trying to do his own race and trying to let the faster car go by. And it kind of shows you trying to catch the the slower traffic at the right time. And, you know, at that point, well, the, the SimRC.de caught it at the right time. David Williams acknowledged it. He gave it all the space that he needed and along he went. Andre Borcher out for Hoyts and Velcro Motorsports, Dennis Grabowski for Pure Racing Team Black, and again, Patrick Pichler stays out on track. So what we're seeing here is an uber long stint coming in from Pure Racing Team. Patrick Pichler 
has saved quite a bit of fuel on this one. I don't remember him going this long on the opening stint of the event here, at Paul. Yeah, they're, they're certainly pushing that fuel number and pushing how far they can go on one, one tank here. But if it's working for you, you might as well do it and get as far as you can because that'll work in your favour towards the end of the race here as we're, uh, what, an hour and... Uh, sorry, two hours and ten minutes into this race now. Some people going for that hour-long stint in your GT3 and GTE field, whereas some are choosing to just basically run the tank dry. Personally, I would be going for the latter. I would be going to run that tank dry and to, to try and get that really short pit stop for your final pit stop, but uh, we'll have to see how we go in this one. But I would imagine that Patrick Pichler should be heading on towards pit road this time by. Yeah, you should imagine that he has to come in at some stage, so he needs to work out when that needs to be. Esther Racing currently hold a gap of, I'd say, about six, seven seconds right now over Santeri Kalunki, but that gap could come down over the next few stages as PRT Red now find themselves on the Ullman straight, the back straight here at the circuit of Sebring as they now head into the right-hander of Sunset Bend, of course, the corner with a 1,004 lines. And, well, Pichler rounding, rounding, slowing, diving down onto the lane. Alvin, it's pit stop time. It's a bend after 31 laps at car number 72. Pure Racing Team Red with Patrick Beachler coming into the pits. Now the question is, are they going to change drivers? Well, they come into the pits and they slot in. Now uh, we wait and wait and wait and it kind of looks like so far they are not going to change drivers. Patrick Beachler is going to stay in car number 72 for one more stint. Another stint for Patrick Schler. They do have the options of some very, very uh, accomplished drivers that they can put into that number 72 machine. Some of them include Patrick Heinrich and Evo Howler. They have the opportunity to put them in, but they won't for now. So Pichler will stay in that vehicle. Where is Esther racing in comparison? The answer is heading through the Le Mans section into the right-hander then of Le Mans and into the Ullman straight he comes along. Marin Cholak would probably hand over the vehicle to Verdan Krauj at some stage in this event, but I doubt that we'll see that until probably around hour four maybe even hour five and that will be found on uh, our race spot tv live timing at that sort of stage but around the final corner goes maran cholak pure racing team red are still in the box still waiting they've got to get going at some stage and i think it's too late there goes uh, esther racing and here will come also call sim racing who's going to get the jump so it is a very much firm position number three right now paul for the team of what is going to be pure racing team red yep they've uh they've just in that slot in that position coming out of pit road now we'll be able to see how they uh, get on once the timing just catches up with it and about five seconds behind call sim racing so we're in, in a good position at the moment but it was a what one minute eight second pit stop for them as we say esther racing had the short pit stop Core race, it's horse sim racing. Sorry, had the longer pit stop. We're waiting for uh, CBR powered by uh, Craig Doug um, to head into pit road for their pit stop here. I know I've just brutalised that uh, that name, by the way, but um, you know that's what you get when uh, you know I'm English and that's the name. I think it's uh, it's kind of a, a dig. Of course, a, a Craig Doc Paul uh, is actually from British driver Craig A. Williams. Oh, well, there you go. You learn something new every day. You certainly do. A Craig doc is probably the most used document apart from the VRS document. So uh, when you have yourself a Craig A. Williams document, you know that your setup is pretty good. As Lewis Goodway rounds the final corner, looks to dive down onto the lane, and he will be playing the waiting game as he waits for a pit stop. But... At the front of the field, that gap is now starting to open through the traffic here. Tommaso Carl has had that gap open again uh, from Santeri Kekkonen. It's now three and a half seconds, Alvin, and Vendaval are now going to get themselves heads down because they have a little bit of clear traffic before they head to SRT, Sport Green and the like. 
And that is what you need on a race like this. Whenever you had clear traffic, you had to take advantage of it. And right now, Tommaso Carla making sure that he takes every single advantage that he can, making sure that he, he can extract the most speed out of this car, trying to open that gap because he knows once he hits traffic, he's going to be in trouble and Santeri Kekonen will close that gap. Yeah, he will. And now he will get to the traffic. Arguably a good position to find Alessandro Bachelega. Of course, a driver that's come out of Wave Driving Revolution into SRT Esports Green. And Paul, I do want to talk about this SRT Esports Green, but not right now because Pure and Radicals are in this battle. And look how close they are together. Yeah, they were getting caught up behind traffic and uh, Radicals are right up under that gearbox of that uh, Pure Racing Team white car. They are meaning business now. Cal Janssen, I think, is getting the hammer down here, trying to get that position. Taking that slightly tighter line through there. There is a nasty bump on the middle of that corner, that last corner, uh, which can unsettle the car. But across the line they go again. They've now got a bit of clear track, so maybe Pure Racing Team with Patrick Wolf can just ease out a little bit again, just uh, getting away from the traffic. It's what was holding them up there. Look at that Patrick Wolf running really wide in the exit of turn number one. Carl Janssen, he's, uh, he's really putting the pressure on here, and I think Wolf may be feeling that pressure a little bit too much. And every single little mistake, even if he doesn't get the position, is more and more information that can be used by Carly Hansen to pick apart the mind, the body, and the soul of Patrick Wolf. Run here to the right-hander of the hairpin. And you're seeing, Alvin, that actually Carly Hansen is slightly backing out of these moves. He doesn't want to get onto the aggressive factor. He doesn't want to be pushing through and trying to get positions in a certain sort of way adam tierney could be a driver that gets put in onto this team and could be a driver that you know very underrated could do a job here to try and unsettle this pure racing team machine which could throw in mark elkerman at some stage it can for sure but we also have to think that there is really no point in trying to fight for these positions right now there's still plenty of racing to go maybe with two hours to go but even three hours to go that's when that's when that's when perhaps you start to get it that when you start to get a little bit more racy but right now it's just trying to keep up uh, keep that patience going if you see a mistake from the car in front then that's when you go for that position otherwise just stay behind try to save your car save tires save a little bit of fuel any bit of fuel that you can save. especially we are going to see this in the daytona prototype class every fuel that you can save it will it will definitely help you towards the end of the race Oh, I'm going to backtrack because we were going to try and talk about SRT Esport yes. Green. Do you think that they are going to be the next generation of quick GT drivers with the likes of Kenny Roosens there, Ulysses DePau, uh, Alessandro Bacilega? Do you feel like they're building this really strong core group? They, uh, they certainly are trying to build a team here. Uh, there's a number of teams you could say, really, that are, are trying to build teams together. I mean, you look at SRT, you look at Triton as well. You could almost say the same... I mean, we talked about Triton earlier. SRT, I feel like pretty much the same thing. They're trying to build that team up, trying to get themselves progressed forward. And uh, certainly, SRT, they have an opportunity. They've got talented drivers there uh, in that team. It's, it's how they go about working as a team, working together. I can almost basically repeat myself what I said to Triton about Triton earlier on. It's how they develop and push on and and maybe get those, uh, those extra maybe one or two tenths per lap to help push them forward. They keep looking forward because that's where you want to head. And uh, certainly they've got that opportunity here. They've got the talent there. It's just making it all work together in these events. And it's all about gaining the experience. Team Bushfink Racing Pink are currently on the podium right now. They've got through on Follow Me Esports now in fourth position as Santeri Kekkonen gets past the pair of them on the brakes into the right-hander. But that gap is continuously coming down to Tommaso Carle. It keeps extending to around three and a half seconds. It then suddenly loses about a second or so in terms of time before suddenly gaining again. Now Rocco Barone will need to be overtaken by Kekkonen. Easy as you like. Then it's Don Fialo, Thrustmaster. Mavano, no! Round go, 
comes Fialo and in the middle of the circuit and gets out of the way off the circuit. Maybe should have held the brakes a little bit, but that's a moment that I don't think is going to be doing too many favours. Mavano making contact with Vendaval, Alvin. Mavano with Vendaval again, and that kind of brings up all this rivalry that we've been talking about with all the teams. Mavano with Vendaval, Vendaval with Radicals, you know, all these rivalries that have been brewing throughout this year, throughout previous seasons. Perhaps it was something that it was just an incident, or perhaps it was something that for some of these drivers, they are not going to see it as just a mere incident. They may see it like, okay, you are doing something for something that happened maybe two months, two months, maybe two years ago. Well, I hope it, I hope, of course, that cooler heads will prevail. But Paul, there is one consistent value with Vendaval. It's the fact that they're getting into a lot of arguments with a lot of teams. And the question then becomes, would they change their driving style if they are upsetting so many teams in the paddock? Um, see, the difficult thing is, if you've been successful, you've got to, you've got to push the limits to be successful, and they are pushing the limits. Uh, certainly, uh, it may be questionable with some tactics. Um, I don't know. It's, there's a little bit of you've got to read as well what's happening in these in these multi-class events. You've got to try and. You know, sort of work together with the the cars, the other cars that are on the track. And I think you know, it's all well and good being a fast driver, and Santeri Kekkonen is no doubt a very fast driver. But you've got to have that racecraft there as well, and you've got to look, know how to work through way through traffic. And I tell you what, Tomasa Carla has just caught up a little bit more time on that last lap, another nine tenths of a second. So uh, Carla has really got the bit between the teeth. And Vanderbilt, if they keep on getting involved in shenanigans like that, they'll put themselves up some damage, they'll make themselves slower, and before you know it, you're, you're losing out on the lead. And, and Vanderbilt sim racing there, if they have a little bit of a wiggle through turn number five, how often, Alvin, do we say that they are the nearly men of sim racing? How they always look to kick on, and they did very well. They are the defending champions in prototype category when it comes to this G, uh, to this prototype field, sorry. And they're looking to defend their crown two years in a row. Their difference is, though, between last year and this year, it is now more pressure on them to succeed, whereas, say, 12 months ago, they were a little less uh, known when it came to being a very strong team and when they took that victory people went oh Vendaval actually do mean business it certainly is and you know it kind of takes a little bit of time to kind of build your team to kind of build your reputation and for and for now Vendaval sim racing they have been doing a good job yes sometimes at times they have met, they have been in both an incident but like Paul says sometimes you gotta push the limits to find where where the actual limits are and sometimes where you think the limit is well that is not the limit you can go a little bit further and yes at the end of the day they are humans and i'm pretty sure they will learn from their mistakes yeah well that's going to be something that only time can really procure and only time can really uh, say that can change the destiny that they have Wolf still in this battle with Carly Janssen, that one close, but Carly Janssen definitely not in a position to get aggressive, to get on the attacking factor, as uh, we're starting to see here some more teams having these battles. Redface racing against Crypto G racing right now, Giuseppe Iannucci against Benjamin Gonzalez, and well, Giuseppe Iannucci, the Iannucci brothers, Paul, uh, Giuseppe and Pasquale, they are incredibly underrated as drivers. And I mean, like, I can't believe that no team has ever thought about trying to pick them up as a, as a pair in a unit. I mean, <laughs> the thing with brothers is you, you have this sort of uh, connection. You know, you grew up together, you're, you, you're used to being around each other, you know how each other works. And uh, it's, they seem to put that forward in a positive light that really seems to progress forward in their driving in their, their racing here those Ian Hitchie brothers you know if you sign them both up to a team you know you could you could really build something you, you've got you, like I say for these sorts of events where you're only going to have two maybe three drivers taking part in this event you've got a team there you know, the, the, already you know so you, you can just 
build on that, work with them, look at how you can improve them. And all of a sudden, you know, you're progressing forward as a bigger unit and you've got some stronger drivers on, on your team, on your books. So, uh, yeah, I'll tell you what, they're doing a good job for Crypto G Racing at the moment. They're uh, battling away with uh, Red Face Racing and uh, they're giving it a good old go here. They are giving it a good old go, and I will say that they are some of the best versatile drivers that you see out there. They're very good in a Mustang, um, as far as I know, the Uduchis can be, and they're also very accomplished when it comes to a Mazda MX-5, so that's always something just to keep in mind when it comes to uh, a racing like this. Back to the GT3 battle for the lead, though. Santeri Kalunki is being reeled in in fact, I think it's yeah. pretty much abstained here at this stage. It's not really a real in. It's pretty much stayed exactly the same sort of gap, Alvin, between Pichler and, and Kalunki right now. And Kalunki knows what's needed. But get this on the last lap. Half a second quicker, Maran Cholak. Half a second quicker, but I think it's, it's pretty much uh, the fact that all of the drivers have to deal with traffic right now. And sometimes as a slower class, it is best to uh, not go to your regular braking markers and per um, perhaps lift a little bit early and let the faster cars go by. So perhaps that is what happened, what is happening right now to to car number three, trying to get to let that slower truck to sorry that faster cars go by uh, without him being in both in an incident. And yes, it, this kind of goes back and forth. The same will happen with to Santeri Kaluki. He will have to lift just a little bit early to let the faster cars go by as that as the Thrustmaster Mivano goes by as well. So this will be pretty much going back and forth. But as the race goes on, perhaps Santeri Kaluki will pick up the pace and he will definitely be able to catch to car number three. Yeah, he definitely has that opportunity to make something happen as I had a look at Carly Jansen as he pushed Ricardo Ferreira off the circuit at Tower Corner. And I have to say in that incident, Paul, I know you probably haven't caught that, but no. Carly Jansen was desperately trying to hang on to Patrick Wolf, couldn't afford to get that gap up to a second. And I think Ricardo Ferreira would be, feel very aggrieved there, although it is understandable why that would happen. Your leader is on to pit road, by the way. Um, yeah, Carly Jansen just dropped back a little bit these last uh, few laps. And that's dropped him back to about 1.2 seconds now. So uh, he's going to be rushing hard. We're into that pit stop phase now with your Daytona prototypes and your leader on pit road at the moment. How far, how much further does uh, Carlo go? Because again, he only went one lap longer on that last pit stop. You wouldn't imagine him to go two laps longer on that last pit stop. But uh, really, if, if he only comes in at the end of this pit stop, uh, at the end of this lap, should I say, then uh, Tomasa Carla, you would think, is not quite getting the same fuel economy as he was on that first stint, but uh, we'll have to wait and see about that one, but uh, Kekkenham, out of pit road already, round into turn number one, and he's then in fourth place at the moment, but of course, he's the first of the uh, front runners to make their latest pit stop. Yeah, just got in front of Justin Hopp uh, in the Team Hoistingveld 78 machine, which is currently uh, on an island on its own in position number five out on circuit. So the question becomes, as Tommaso Carla gets a heavy hold up, one Gianni Vecchio, one Maran Cholak, as both of them are all up their leading category drivers, first, second and first, or first, second and second, shall we say, Tommaso Carla becomes the big loser in all of that as Marin Cholak, as we have stated before, does the right thing, holds his line, runs his own race. It's your job to get past me, but that will not help Tommaso Carla, who wanted a clean lap to really go and attack Vendaval Sim Racing. And I don't think they're going to have that available. Do they dive down onto the lane after Sunset Bend this time by? The answer is no. They want another lap out of it. And they have been consistently going for 26 laps in the last couple of stints. So definitely Tommaso Carlac in that triple three car. They definitely have the fuel mileage game down to down to. So they are going to go one more lap here, trying to deal with traffic in here. Yes, they are trying to go through slower traffic. And like we say, it is the responsibility of the fast. They go off track. They That shows you how hard they are pushing on this, on this stint to try to get in front of car number 24. 
Well, you could see he was pushing hard. He was down on the inside track there, Paul, and he just couldn't get that vehicle turned in. He maybe needed to give himself maybe another half a car length to give himself that opportunity. Yes, he's pushing, but now, you know, he gets in that stage where if you're going to push hard here, you've been stuck behind two very quick drivers in different categories. You've been held up. Is this the red mist starting to descend here for Tommaso Carla? He was on the dirty line as well. He was kicking up all the dust, so uh, he was really struggling to get that car stopped, and it showed there. And uh, it would also show uh, he had to just serve a little bit of a slowdown penalty, of course, because he uh, cuts across the grass there on the inside of the corner. So uh, not the best lap, and if this is his in lap, it's an absolute disaster for him. And this one, uh, his compatriot in the uh, the 24 car is only about 40. 40 and a half seconds behind. And we're looking at pit stop being about 47, 48 seconds from uh, cone to cone on the pit lane. Not to mention that coming onto pit road and coming off of it. Tomasa Carla coming down that back straight now. Will we see him dive into the pit lane? I would imagine this time by, yes, he will. Well, that's just what we imagine, but sometimes uh, the, the, uh, the mind can be a very curious thing as Tommaso Carla rounds the final corner, looks to dive onto the lane. So it is a poor in-lap, and it's an uncharacteristically poor in-lap from the Thrustmaster Mavano DP Black Machine, the 3-3-3. Three, three, three. And I will say something, all the teams with threes in have been doing very well. Esther Racing Team, number three, is up there winning. Corsin Racing, 33 in second in class. And they got the 3-3-3 three, three, three of Thrustmaster Mavano. Currently leading category, big heavy brakes onto the lane. Just about gets sl uh, slowed down. And let's get some racing royalty out. Jose Maria Lopez, Paul. Yeah, he's uh, jumping in the car now. This is uh, what we want to see now. Jose Maria Lopez, what can he do with that car? <sighs> I tell you what, that was uh, very looking up to Mrs. Uh, Pitstall coming into pit. Van Devil, Sim Racing White, they're gone through turn number one. So they're through, they're taking the position. But of course, they've not had to change the driver on that last pit stop. Here we go then, Jose Maria Lopez, Thrustmaster Mavano, DP Black, out of pit road now. Slotting in behind a couple of GT3 cars there. But the crucial thing was there was nobody alongside, so he didn't have to compromise himself on pit exit. They can focus now on moving forward about 11 and a half seconds behind your race leader now. But of course, the pit stop was 31 seconds compared to 24.3. Seven seconds difference in the stop. That's what it is. The same could be said in the battle for position number three. It's now Mark Elkerman behind the wheel of the Pure Racing Team White Machine. Crucially enough, though, there is a gap over to the driver, Carly Janssen, who has remained in the vehicle and now gets his seven-second margin. And look at the amount of traffic now that Elkerman has to go through in comparison to what the driver, Carly Janssen, has had to go through, Alvin. It definitely is, and it kind of shows you well. But the good thing is that with the fresh drivers, yes, you will be caught into traffic, but, but you don't have that race fatigue that the previous drivers have been having so far trying to deal with traffic and the racer and everything. So you are the fresh driver, so being put on the traffic, yeah, it, it may not be the best of the situations for sure, but you are fresh, so you still have the mind fresh, so you know how to pick your battles here and there. Yes, sometimes you come with a lot of energy and it can be drained quickly, but that is part of multi-class racing for sure. It certainly is a part of multi-class racing as uh, we're just waiting on the gym racing team to make that stop as they have Miko Melkola behind the wheel right now and they are traditionally going for the long stop as Jim have a tendency to do uh, and Paul I think Miko Melkola maybe has sat on his laurels a little bit after what was a very successful last season uh, what does Miko Melkola need to do to find the sort of pace that he was showing maybe 12 months ago just look at what he was doing 12 months ago look at maybe if he's had any changes maybe it's different equipment uh different process going into races as he comes onto pit road now you've just got to analyze yourself you've got to look at yourself and say right what what am i doing that's maybe not getting me the consistency it could purely just be a simple thing that other people have progressed at a faster rate than yourself you know that's that's another thing you've got to contend with you've got to look at it and say well hang on a second you know i'm, I'm still i'm still performing at the top of my abilities it's just that others have maybe 
moved up and moved up into that sort of area that you're operating at. So it's not the worst. It's not the worst time in the world for me, Kurt, but uh, certainly it's just a, to a bit of self-analysis, look at his performances and say, right, where can I make those improvements? Where can I get those little half a tenth here and there? So uh, definitely, you know, that's what it is. It's uh, 24.8 seconds back out of pit. Back out of pit. Just trying to look at where he's come out in comparison. I believe he's come out behind the Teo Martin eSport machine. So what we'll do is we'll go through a top eight rundown of how the field stacks up right now. Vendaval Sim Racing Blue leads this one. It's 11 and a half seconds to Thrustmaster Mavano. You have to remember that Mavano have made a driver change. It has not been a driver change yet for Vendaval Sim Racing Blue as Jose Maria Lopez, the Formula E driver, one of the quickest drivers in endurance racing comes into the vehicle. Radicals Online, six sideways, are in third. They haven't made a driver change yet. Your racing team might have Mark Elkerman now behind the wheel. It's Team Hoisingvel up in position number five. Justin Hopper, a driver that we haven't really heard too much of when it's come to sim racing, has just sat and played a very calm game, keeping themselves out of trouble. Teo Martin Esports, GoPro Lopez, Pablo Lopez is there. Arguably one of the most exciting uh, and most well-known sim racers on the planet, having a fantastic run of things in sixth position. Seventh right now is being occupied by the Gym Racing GTR Center. Miko Melkula there, and rounding out eight at this stage is Thrustmaster Mavano DP Red, Philip Bauer behind the wheel. Paul, you're standing by with GTE. Yeah, absolutely. It's pure racing team that are leading this one. Maximilian Beneke has been in the car since the start, and he's uh, got an 18 and a half second lead of the CMRC to the Bavaria Gianni Vecchio. Again, the car driver has been in from the start in second place. Third place, Team Bush Racing picks got Grazia doing a good job there. And fourth place for the GTEs is Follow Me Esports, Ricardo Ferreira behind the wheel down in fourth. Fifth place then for Logical Vortex Sim Racing 12 hour GTE. Manuel Petri there and in sixth place Inertia Blackstar that, that combined effort there between the two of them. Sixth place not going too bad so far. Seventh for Team Hoisting Feld Maximilian Fritz uh, in that car and Crypto G Racing Giuseppe Iannucci round out the top eight in your GTE field and now with the GT3 field it's Alvin. Victor Lies and now for after almost more than two and a half hours we have the car number three as the racing team pretty much from pole position they as they have been involved in some battles but so far being able to keep the lead but it's only 6.2 seconds from number 33 course in racing driven right now by Santeri Kalunki and P number three the pure racing team red of Patrick Peacher, these three have been swapping that lead back and forth, so it's gonna be interesting how this goes towards the end of the race now. Coming here into P4, we got the VRS Coanda since for the number 18 being driven by Rocco Barone. He's been, you know, a bit of a quiet race here by VRS Coanda, but doing so, but doing good so far. Car number one in Hoisin Belt Core Motorsports and P, and P number five with Andre Borcher. P number six, the pure racing team back with Denny Trabowski. And P7 and P8, a really interesting battle right now between the Simicube, NX Racing Red, and the SRT Esports Green. And SRT Esports Green have actually just got through on this lap. Alessandro Bachelega is through on the driver of, I well, was just behind, sorry, the driver of what is Jack Sedgwick. So Sedgwick now, the man under pressure. As you look at Bachelega, you talk about the Italians in sim racing. You know, they don't often make the biggest presence here, Paul. I think it's very uh, common to say that, but the drivers that they do pull in, you know, you talk about Fulvio Barazzini, you talk about the likes of Bachelega, you talk even uh, uh, about the likes of the Marco City Econos uh, and the like, you know, they have some really talented drivers. How often do we see David Greco pop up? Ray oh. Revolution round goes Sedgwick. He holds it together. No, he doesn't. He's going to hit the fence and that is in X. Simu Cube is done. I tell you, that is an absolute nightmare. It's certainly not what he wanted. He's uh, feeling the steering. He's sw just swinging it back and forth, seeing how that car feels. And he is struggling for the time being. He does not feel comfortable in that car. 
It's going to hurt. There's not too much damage there. If there's not too much damage there, he could keep it out on track. But uh, I mean, it was big drama there. And it was uh, a car that they were lapping there. But was it Phoenix Motorsports that they were trying to lap there uh, with that one, the, uh, the black car? That's, uh, yeah, it was the uh, number 20 car, Phoenix Motorsports. So really big, big drama for Sedgwick. Maybe not just crowd, try to crowd out that car a little bit too much as they're heading into uh, the final corner now. Interesting to see whether Cedric dives onto pit lane or whether he stays out for another lap. He's going to stay out for another lap here. It seems that the damage should be okay. And Rupe Turkula, uh, Alvin, you know, you have been a part of teams like Phoenix. You know, Rupe Turkula isn't a stranger when it comes to getting caught up in an incident from now and then. Oh, you know, sometimes uh, things happen, and, and for a driver like Robert Torquilla, yeah, definitely he can be really patient, but you know, sometimes when you are involved in your own battles, you kind of focus on what's happening just ahead of you, and sometimes you forget what's on your sides, what's right behind you, and well, you know, sometimes a little bit of miscommunication happens, and well, you know, kind of unfortunate right now for Jack said, but fortunately, it kind of seems like he can keep the car driving at a, at a, at a, decent pace so now it's just, it's just a matter of trying to cool down making sure that you get your laps down and once you come into the pit to uh, perhaps assist the damage i'm pretty sure that they will be able to to continue this race i do have to say the battle fourth fifth and sixth in gt3 paul is actually a lot closer than people will give it credit for dennis grabowski is in the wheelhouse of trying to find andre bork for about six seven seconds and Andre Borcher is in the wheelhouse of finding Rocco Barone. So you're looking at these teams, and these are not teams that are any slouches at all. Uh, you talk about these teams in the first series of uh, VRS iRacing GT that were up there fighting for the title. You talk Kawanda, you talk Heusingveld, you talk Pure. These are the teams that are there and are normally fighting for the big money prizes. They're fighting for the biggest races in iRacing. And, they are up there having this fantastic event. And right now, Andre Borcher, he's got to think, well, am I in defensive mode now from Dennis Grabowski or am I in offensive mode attacking Rocco Barreau? It's a funny one with Hoyt's got come on spots because, again, they were coming through around the similar sort of time as Pure Racing Team. We thought those two were going to be the ones to, to really uh, push on and to, to really be the ones to challenge those, those big teams of red line and... There, I suppose it's in the sport, you know, all those well established teams. But how's it come on? They just seem to have gone off the ball just a little bit in recent times. And you know, the, the first round of the uh, VRS iRacing GT World Championship race certainly wasn't a good start for them, it wasn't a good start for a few teams. But this now fifth place in this GT3 field, I think this is all about getting them, getting them seat time in that car. Getting to learn that Mercedes a bit more, see how it feels. Of course, we have had a balance of performance change slightly uh, for that Mercedes in this last week, and they'll be hoping that that's going to bring them more into into the battle as the uh, the World Championship Series goes on this year. But right now, it's it's a, it's a solid position for Hoisin Komo Sports, and they'll be looking to try and just progress forward and to challenge Vera Aspen and Simsport because they're not that far ahead. Alvin. And we also had to remember that the next race for the VRS GT Series will take place here at Sebring. It's going to be three hours. And for many of these teams, like Hoistable Court Motorsports, the teams like Enix, teams like uh, VRS Coenda, they are getting as much information as possible on these cars with the new balance of performance and with the latest update. So any track time that they can get on these cars on this setting on this build it will be very valuable come two weeks time uh, so paul when you get down to that we, we know that coanda did not want to run a vehicle at the 12 hours of bathurst mainly because they knew that the six hours was coming up they didn't want to risk putting in someone like mitchell de jong showing their hand again you're not going to see a driver like mitchell de jong come out show their hand they're going to try and use different drivers like rocco barone who is uh, very sparsely used by coanda someone like even joni tackle oh we've just seen an instant triton and Simi cube in x racing it's jack oh. sedgwick involved again so oh. not not content with having one instant he's had another instant there this time at the last corner there triton were trying to go around the outside and they've just ended up getting turned around luckily 
not into a wall and Triton are able to carry on but Jake Stagios has been able to get past so one in car helping out the other one. Yeah very much so in that case and I, you have to feel for Triton I don't think Victor Smolajic deserved that to go his way I think he knew that you know maybe there should have been a little bit more communication on the radio okay this is Jack Sedgwick he has been involved in an incident earlier on I think it's sometimes things like that Paul um, from a spotter that I think sometimes more information needs to be given to the drivers on the ground so that they can make better decisions I'll tell you what I, if I was trying to race I would have maybe made a note that Jack Sedgwick had was running with damage and he was running slower laps maybe not trying that move straight away around the outside at, at the final corner you, if you've got the pace over that car in front because they've got damage you're going to get past them it's just a matter of when not if so maybe a little bit of inexperience there showing through a little bit of naivety and uh, just unfortunate they were involved in that but luckily they are able to carry on and they've only lost down about three seconds overall well, it's only three seconds, but as we all know in sim racing, three seconds. I can go at any given point in time. As uh, We have seen a couple of drivers dive down onto pit road at certain stages. I know that the team uh, of Crypto G Racing was down on the lane at one stage. They've changed drivers. It was Giuseppe Iannucci. It's now the brother Pasquale that needs to go out there and make things happen. They're in a scrap with Red Face Racing. They came down at the same time. Julian Ofre back behind the wheel, Alvin. And, well, they, they all the teams just keep battling in here back and forth with the, with all the driver swaps here and there. And this is the, and now comes that part of the race that we are closing into the end of our number three. We still have just under 50 minutes to go to close this third hour. And now it's perhaps when, when we see teams, yeah, they do the driver swaps here and there, but now this is the portion of the race from here all the way to perhaps three to two laps to three to two hours to go, sorry, that you gotta be patient. You just gotta see, okay, this is where I'm standing, where I wanna go, where I want to be at the end of the race well ideally on victory lane but in order to do that this is what we need to do and they and they need to start getting the strategy try to get going try to see where they are where they want to be and what they need to do oh the big wiggle from pierre Vern in the race clutch red machine he just got absolutely sideways i think is the right word for it as he looked to try and make that push through the pair of them just about manages to make that happen but was never ever going to be ideal and Jose Maria Lopez is about to just encroach on the four of them as now Nicholas Schneider in the Sorg eSports P1 machine wants to start thinking about making some moves through as well I think we're starting to see here Paul drivers are making mistakes and making more mistakes than what you'd normally get to see I think now if you're someone like Jose Maria Lopez chasing down the leaders, you have to go so cautious against this traffic because you don't know what they are going to do at any time. Yeah, and you just have to look you know, the, the behind the 91 there. And uh, that 91 is not going to want to just park the car and let them go past there, although saying that, they move out wide, let that uh, second place car go through. Jose Maria Lopez looking at his gap there. 13 seconds uh, between him and uh, the race leader. He's having to work his way through traffic as well. It's, it's all about how you manage that traffic. And we kept on saying about how Thrustmaster Mavana are able to work that traffic better as he dives down the inside of that uh, Ferrari of uh, Crypto G Racing. And, uh, well, interested to see how the laps compare this time around because of Endeavour Sim Racing Blue they're just going to come round the start and finish straight now across the timing line they're just complete a lap now 55.385 interesting to see what Thrustmaster Mavano do here for a lap time they're going to come across the timing line now and it is a 155.76 second 7 so um, just a few tenths slower, but they did have to work their way through quite a chunk of traffic there. I have to agree with that. Jose Maria Lopez, even with the traffic, that's still a very impressive lap time. 
able to pull that out of the bag, stem the bleeding a little bit, but still uh, it's bleeding a little bit more. Bushing Racing Pink dropping down the order a little bit. They're now behind Follow Me Esports. Ricardo Ferreira's got through, and suddenly Follow Me seem to have a bit of spark and bite back in their machine right now, Alvin. They've been going backwards, backwards, and being lucky with vehicles running into issues. They're now starting to push on forward. I don't think they're going to get close to Bavaria anytime soon. They're about half a lap down the road. I don't see them even getting as close to Pure Racing Team, but Follow Me Esports suddenly look racy again. And that is one of the beauties here of... of this race that you really have to be patient yes just because you had a bad start just because you had a bad qualifying that really doesn't mean anything that's pretty much for setting the grid once the green flag drops that's when you see the real pace that's when that's when you see the drivers the teams that can keep their cars clean and for now follow me esports they have been doing what they need to do right now running in p3 i think they can still do a good job in here and who knows maybe towards the end of the race maybe even battling for the class win well, the battle is there. They know what they need to do. They know that they have to keep on pushing on forward. There are no other alternatives when you get right down to it. And I think that what we've been seeing here as we are heading towards the end of the opening three hours, Paul, is that we've seen a race that has been very clean. And whilst there has been a couple of blips in terms of that clean driving standard, I still think that we've seen a lot of driving, which I think a lot of teams can be proud of. And I think that a lot of teams are put in a really nice position to set up attacks for the second third of this event. Wow, what happened there? Cholak's on his roof. I haven't... What, the wheel's gone? Was it legitimately just straight on, no contact? Oh, and Maran Cholak, that is... Cr that's cruel because Esther Racing Team Pool, they have been up there all this year. They have proven they have the pace to go and mince it with the big boys. And that, as an initiative killer, as a dagger through the back. Oh, you have to feel for Maran Cholak. And you can see it's taking him a good 30 minutes to go, what has gone on? It has to hurt if you're a driver working so hard to get yourself up there, keep yourself moving forward. But the good news about that instant, Alvin, it's right on the outside. It's not on the pit exit line. It's just there on the outside of the concrete. Marin Cholak is off the racing circuit. He will not be affecting anybody in terms of the line moving forward, and that's crucial. That is definitely one one good thing out of this that he is outside of the racing line. Yes, he is out. Uh, he is out on the pit exit line. But I know that uh, we are still a little bit far off from the VLAN. But I think it's. Uh, I, I think what happened to Mari Kalak was really unfortunate. But I think Jake and Paul, we need to warm up this line. Yes, it was like that time when Mankind got thrown off the top of hell in a cell by the Undertaker. Oh, Randy Chenneth, I didn't know you were here. Um, but you, you're looking at that and you, you do get frustrated sometimes uh, when incidents like that happen. I mean, we've seen all sorts of things, Paul, uh, happen in sim racing. I, I, I've seen some things like a wheel catch fire midway through a race. Meyer. That, that was something. In that situation, though, there was that two-minute gap was there as Marin Cholak is now finally off the circuit. Uh, I, 
I still think, though, that, you know, hardware failures, you know, you can't predict them. They happen. And, you know, what more can you say except, you know, hard luck, go get a new wheel or something like that. Dennis Grabovsky versus Andre Borcher, though, pure versus core. And how often in German sim racing, Alvin, have we seen pure versus core? Well, if we go all the way back to when we began broadcasting PLN, that's, that's been pretty much one of the big battles that we have seen uh, from Poor versus Pure. And this is a battle that will not go away anytime soon. And these two, this, these two big GT teams that, you know, they, they go for it. They want to see who is the best. And well, for now, yeah, Pure Racing Team, it is ahead, but Racing but Core Motorsports, they are not so far behind and they want to go ahead. They do want to go ahead, they do want to push, and they do need to start thinking about this one because this is for position number four, and suddenly Coanda, playing the quiet race, are on the podium with Rocco Barone. But the question then becomes, it's a straight-up dogfight between Core and Pure, but Hoixenveld Core Motorsports right now, if they want position number four, they've got to go out there and work for it because Alessandro Bachelega is not too far down the road here, Paul and uh, there's not too much difference in terms of the times either. Yeah, certainly. Um, I'll tell you what, this race has just certainly woken us up a little bit there with that one instant, but um, it's a few teams now. You've seen these gaps growing here today, but you've also uh, seen the, a few battles sort of coming together as well. That GT3 battle's going on. You've got a battle in your uh, GTE. Uh, with Crypto and Redface but that battle for fourth place in your GT3, that's a really interesting one and as we were saying, SRT they're moving closer they're trying their best to get with these two in front and uh, Pure and Hoisin and uh, Cobb Motorsports they're not holding each other up there so um, yeah, it, it, it's at the moment they've got about a second gap between them so they're able to just calm down and run their own races here Alvin, you know how sometimes we like to joke about how uh, sim racing drivers listen to what we say in the booth whilst they're driving? Yeah, I, it is, you know, yeah. I Go think ahead. Mikko Melkler is starting to get the message here. He's brought the gap down under three seconds between him and Teo Martin Esports, and suddenly Pablo GoPro Lopez is not safe for position six. Yeah, it certainly is, and now for this portion of the race, uh, Mikko Melkler trying to close the gap right there on, on Pablo Lopez, but... I think if they end up closing the gap, we may see uh, perhaps Pablo Lopez just pulling ahead at the uh, team that there is no point in trying to fight for that position right now. Or, you know what, who knows? Maybe he'll say, you know what, I don't care. I'm going to fight anytime I can. Well, he will have that opportunity to close that down as they are heading towards the mid to late part of their stint as we head to what we like to call the twilight zone when it comes to this broadcast. So. Paul, something you can take away from this broadcast or something you can take away from the opening three hours of the event? <laughs> what we could take away from the three, opening three hours of the event is anything can happen here. Uh, and that's certainly what has happened. One thing that is certain is that Vendemel Sim Racing Blue do have the pace out of the, D, uh, the Daytona prototypes. But at the moment, you know, Thrustmaster Mavano, they're not out of this one yet. They did lap that last lap faster. So uh, they're fighting on traffic is getting involved as well so uh, interesting to see how that one goes in your GT, GTEs as well pure racing team Maximilian Beneke when he jumps out the car it'll be how they perform when he's out that car that's certainly going to be the interesting part of the race for them well they have uh, Maximilian Venig and Jonas Volmeyer. if you wanted the strongest team possible that's probably it as but all three of those drivers sit top five in the I rankings right now Alvin what are you going to take away from this one well, pretty much this has been a race of trying to survive and a little bit of patience. Yes, the the attrition rate has been really low, but on the other hand, just because you are on the lead doesn't mean you are safe at all. We saw what happened to Marin Kolak and the Esta Racing Team, unfortunately really for them. So it's just a matter for all the remaining teams trying to push as hard as you can because you never know when the next calamity will strike. You definitely do not know when the next moment is going to happen. A few thank yous that we can get ourselves through in just a moment's time. It's Vendaval who hold the advantage at the moment. It's Pure Racing Team who look dominant. 
and Core Sim Racing right now only have pure racing team to worry about. But Paul, I'll let you do the honours from here on in. Yep, thank you very much, Shakes. Yeah, that is coming up to the end of our stint here on the iRacing uh, 12 hours of Sebring. It's it'll be a dramatic opening three hours of the race here. Now, don't forget that you can keep abreast of everything that's going on with live timing. You can check it out right there, racebot.tv forward slash timing. You'll be able to uh, keep up to date with everything that's happening. Don't forget, tonight we are showing the final three hours of this race. So from half past 10 GMT, you'll be able to catch the end of this uh, enthralling event here. But uh, a few thank yous, as Jake said, to get through in this one. Uh, just first of all, thank you to Jake Sperry, to myself and to Alvin Nieves uh, in the commentary booth and the cameras. Your cameras are brought to you by Isfan Bello. You can see the uh, website where you can get your own versions of the cameras. Overlay Design brought to you by Andreas Werner of Andwern Designs. Overlay Animation, Simon Grossman from Appgeneer with their Ativo product. And Nick Thiessen able to bring us the live timing. As I say, racebot.tv forward slash timing to keep abreast of everything that's going on in this race. Thank you very much everyone for joining us for the opening part of this broadcast. As I say before, thank you to Alvin and for Jake for joining myself. Who will win the Sebring 12 hours of Sebring, should I say, here on iRacing Live and Racebot TV? You'll be able to find out from half past 10 GMT. Thank you very much and goodbye for now.